All rise, please. We'll have the mayor call the meeting to order. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'd like to welcome everybody to our meeting tonight, Tuesday, November the 17th. We're a little bit delayed in our in-camera meeting downstairs, but here we are. So we'd like to start our meeting off with the singing of O Canada and tonight's performance. It's been recorded and it's done by Amalia Green. Amalia is eight years old. She attends Orchard Park School. She loves musical theater, singing, skating, soccer, and swimming. She also enjoys travel, art, and photography. Quite a bit for an eight-year-old. That's very busy. Thank you to Amalia Green for your rendition of O Canada this evening. So Mr. Clerk, when you're ready. Thank you to Amalia and your family for letting you do this for us today to start off our meeting. That was great. Thank you, everybody. Our next order of business would be the adoption of the minutes from the October 27th meeting. Motion by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Next up, disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Do we have any disclosures? Uh, Councilor Lococo and then uh, Peter Angelo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a conflict on 9.1 downtown BIA. Um, I've sent the information to the clerk and 9.19 downtown BIA. Okay, thank you thank for you. that. Councilor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Conflict on uh, CAO 2019-06. I guess it would be a personal conflict. I had asked a question, Your Worship, of myself, myself only, uh, through Mr. Matson, and that is what I believe precipitated the um, the update. So I'll declare a conflict for a personal reason. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. has got that, Councilor Cario. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, 2020, uh, 1102, 1300623. The letter from the Canadian Hotel Association. Okay, got that one too. Any other disclosures? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to everyone's favorite part of the meeting, especially Councillor Cario and Peter Angelo. Yeah, already it's the mayor's notes. There aren't many. I'll try to do it. We come back at 5:30. Well, we'll be done long before then. Uh, first off, under our obituaries, uh, the Hector Lapierre, retired platoon chief at the Niagara Falls Fire Department, passed away. Our condolences to the family of the Lapierres. Um, actually, it's a kind of special thing tonight that I'd like to acknowledge. And uh, well, we've got all of our council together and our senior staff. Uh, this is an exemplary service award. It's not one that we give every day in these chambers. The Office of the Secretary to the Governor General has awarded the Exemplary Service Medal to Chief Jim Boudelier for his 30 years of service to the City of Niagara Falls Fire Department. And Chief, on behalf of the members of council and our CAO, Ken Todd, all of your staff and our peers, we congratulate Chief Boudelier on this distinguished milestone and a long and prestigious award. Congratulations, Chief.
Now, Chief, I know that you're not here with us at the moment, and nor is the CAO. The CAO, CAO does have the service medal that he wants to personally present to you. Um, I didn't know if maybe you wanted to say a few words to, uh, to your peers and to, to council and uh, let us know how you feel about your exemplary service medal award. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. I mean, it's a great pleasure to work with all those that are at council and senior staff and to represent this fire department uh, and all the staff that go with it. And it's been an excellent career so far for the last 30 years and a little more to go, I hope. <laughs> well, you've definitely been uh, tried and tested through this COVID at, as our lead on the EOC. So we appreciate having you here. Uh, so congratulations from council and all the staff uh, to you, Chief. Moving along, council representation. I want to thank Councillor Thompson for rep representing the city at the Black Military History of Niagara Traveling Exhibit launch at the Armory recently. Thank you for being there, Councillor. Uh, also, uh, community events. Uh, we celebrated recently Remembrance Day. I was joined by Councillor Lococo. It was held Wednesday, November the 11th, of course, at 11 a.m., it was the first ever virtual ceremony held at the Fairview Cemetery. It combined two community services, Chippewa and the city that we normally have at the Gale Center into one observance. What was really neat is the way we ended it with a flyover by the Avro Lancaster. That was very neat and especially to see it flying through the air. You know, it feels like you go back in time. Uh, the other part of interest too was uh, when they fired the cannon <clears throat> you know, it was quite loud, and a couple of our staff that were cleaning the podium uh, were standing just in front of it, and I don't know that if they could see what was about to happen when it happened, and uh, so we just like to say to JP and to Rob McDonald, you know, hopefully uh, your ears are okay and you've recovered from, uh, from that traumatic event. It was uh, quite unbelievable. Even when you saw it happening, it was loud. You felt it in your chest. I can't imagine how they felt standing right in front of the cannon. So uh, anyway, thank you to all involved. It was a great event. The veterans were very happy with it. The weather was perfect. And everyone watching it at home were very complimentary, saying that they could really follow along. They really felt a part of the service. So congratulations to everybody. And to, of course, uh, we stream for live streaming the event as well so that everybody could attend from the comfort of their homes. The Santa Claus Parade drive through event took place this weekend. I was joined by Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, it was unbelievable. We had thousands of people. We had over 700 cars. It was the first and only ever drive through parade here in the region. And I'll tell you how popular it was. We had people from every city in the region, people outside the region. We didn't realize it was going to become a regional parade. And as a result, it was bigger than we expected, unfortunately. Uh, we had to shut it down. We did run it a half hour longer, but we couldn't go any further than that. And to give you a little uh, taste of how big it was, the cars were lined up all the way down Victoria Avenue, around the band up Ferry Street and down Lundy's Lane right to Freshco, way out in the west end of the city. And at the same time, they were backed up the 420 and all arterial and connecting roads into residential areas like Epworth Circle. People could not get out into the parade. It was so big. People waited hours to get to see Santa. Unfortunately, some at the end did not get to see Santa. So we're working on some neat idea to maybe bring Santa back downtown for another event. But uh, I just want to say thank you so much to all the staff who worked so hard, all the volunteers that were working. That same night, we also, and this is really neat, we had the official Christmas tree proclamation. And some of you may not really pay attention, but we've got a big, beautiful spruce tree in front of City Hall. It's now the city's official Christmas tree because of the downtown BIA requesting that we officially proclaim it. So a little bit of history, we found an old newspaper article that the library provided. And it showed that 1978, that tree was moved from Morrison Street, right across the street from St. Mary's School. It was causing a blind spot for bus drivers. They're really worried that maybe there was going to be an accident. So the city of the day purchased the tree for $100, had it transplanted uh, in front of City Hall, and it's been there for 42 years. So that tree is now 72 years old, approximately. It's lit up, it's gorgeous. Santa Claus read the proclamation as we lit it up. We were joined by the Niagara Health Foundation for their Celebration of Lights event. And at the same time, 
we, not that we didn't have enough things going on. We had this massive drive-through parade snarling the city. And, and I do want to say this, uh, Councilor Dabrowski will attest to this. To see people dressed up, they got in the theme. They dressed up as elves. They dressed up in character. They decorated their cars. They all gave food for Project Share, the food bank. Um, and really to see that was so neat. Then to follow that up by the dedication of the tree, uh, to, to have um, the foundation from Niagara Health start their celebration of lights. And then Diwali. They had the launch of Diwali, which is the um, Hindu um, uh, festival of lights where they say uh, light from darkness. Um, you know, it's just the most amazing thing. So they also let up some of their events as well. So congratulations. And of course, that was the same time we kicked off the OPG Winter Festival of Lights. They've got a bunch of new attractions and new exhibits this year. Unbelievable. So congratulations to everybody involved. Staff did not accept that it was going to be canceled. They wanted to figure out a way that we could do it. And we did it. And it was successful. And wow, what an event. We were the victims of our own success. Costco, uh, it's been a long time coming, folks, but we finally turned around a decision from a long time ago, and we brought Costco back to Niagara Falls in all its glory. And, uh, you know, they were telling us that, and, and I don't know uh, when they're going to make the determination, but this very well may have been the, the most successful opening of Costco in Canadian history. We were joined by the president, all the senior vice presidents, uh, the store manager. Uh, it was very well run and very well done. And uh, considering the uh, popularity that they were able to keep everybody the way they did, lots of challenges, but uh, we're happy to have Costco here. And as a result now, Niagara Square is revitalizing. Tenants are extending their leases. They're extending their space. They got a lineup of people that want to move into the, the mall again. So once again, it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting place to be at the Niagara Square. Sleep Cheap Charities Reap. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, of course, is, is our chair. And this is our 17th annual event, which is on now. It's already raised more than $2 million for charity. The good news is all the hotels are deemed an essential service. So they're uh, prepared to be open in a safe way. This is an event that's only open to Niagara residents. And of course, it'll bring much needed money for local charities because 100% of the money stays here in local charities. And we definitely need to thank our hoteliers and our hospitality industry. They're hurting more now than ever before. And we went to them and asked them, do you still want to do it? We'd understand it if you didn't want to do it this year. And they all agreed they still wanted to do it. They said the community needs it. So we just want to say thank you to the hospitality industry for stepping up once again. Niagara Falls Community Outreach is having their food drive. It's taking place Saturday the 28th at Zares from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. All donations are going to be welcome. And of course, that'll be again Saturday, November the 28th, next Saturday. The Arts and Culture Wall of Fame will be recognizing deserving recipients in the community. The award ceremony will be broadcast on your TV. That's Kojiko. It'll take place this Saturday, November the 21st. And lastly, the annual Volunteer Recognition Awards event will be held virtually this year. The community ceremony will be released online December the 5th. You can see them on the city's website and on social media. It's an opportunity for groups and organizations to nominate deserving volunteers to be recognized by your community. Thank you to all the volunteers. This year is going to look a little different, but we appreciate because so many volunteers have been out buying groceries for people, visiting, checking in on them, cutting their grass, sweet, uh, raking leaves, and uh, we've got a lot of extra BNF awards for those people that have stepped up during the time of COVID. And uh, we just want to say thank you to all the volunteers that make Niagara Falls such a great place. Our next council meeting will be Tuesday, December the 8th. And the last thing I do want to mention is uh, later on in the agenda, I will be presenting to council for your consideration a uh, resolution to deal with public health. Uh, I'm going to leave it for later in the agenda when we have a, an item in, under our correspondence when it's more appropriate, but I will be bringing that forward. And we do have a request from Councillor Campbell. Uh, his wife's not well right now, and he's asked that his agenda item, he put forward a notice of motion at the last meeting that we deal with it now. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Cario, that we move that item to take place now. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. So, um, Mr. Clerk, did you uh, want to introduce that item for us? Please. 
Yes, Your Worship, it is uh, listed on tonight's agenda uh, right after ratification of in-camera, so it's uh, item number 11, uh, specifically 11.1. <coughs> there was a notice of motion, as you mentioned, from uh, Councillor Wayne Campbell last meeting, uh, so I believe that uh, uh, he will would like to discuss, and I'll let him introduce it further. Uh, also, uh, we do have uh, resident Stephen Sues uh, on standby via Zoom, uh, should Council wish to hear further from him as well. So perhaps uh, through yourself, Your Worship, we'll turn it over to Councillor Campbell. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Councillor Campbell, are you there? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I greatly appreciate this. And uh, the reason I wanted to move forward was that uh, she's sick at, at the point where she might have to go to the hospital tonight. So um, I wouldn't want to miss this event. Based on my uh, personal experience with mental health and my political experience with homelessness and uh, the needy, I, I, I have come to the uh, conclusion that it's extremely important that we move this forward. Uh, I realize that we as a city can do very, very little because the majority of the money for these types of activities comes from the uh, regional government and the province. So my motion is as follows. Whereas, according to the province of Ontario, Emergency Response Plan 2008, Canadian municipalities are free to declare states of emergencies in response to any situation or impending situation caused by the forces of nature, an accident, an international act, um, and, or constitutes the danger or portions of life or property. I'm sorry. I, the light in here is poor. Whereas approximately 625 residents, including 144 children in Niagara, were counted as homeless. This was from March of 2018, with shelter occupancy operating at 109.4% capacity. Whereas Niagara EMS reported 335 suspected opiate overdoses from January to June of 2019. Whereas some Niagara municipalities have had services such as mental health removed from their hospitals, and whereas Niagara is severely lacking in mental health and addiction services, be it resolved that the city of Niagara Falls request that the region to declare a state of emergency on mental health, homelessness, and addiction. Further, furthermore, the Niagara Regional Council, Niagara Regional Public Health, and Social Services, Premier of Ontario, the Provincial Minister of Health, Minister of the Attorney General, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and the leader of the official opposition, as well as the Prime Minister of Canada, and all regional municipalities be copied on this resolution. I would make that motion. Okay, motion by Councillor uh, Campbell, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Did you want to speak to that, Councillor? Well, it's just, it, I, I, from my personal experience with our daughter, it was uh, very, very difficult. The uh, mental health services, uh, there's no follow-up. If, if my daughter was sent to the hospital with cancer, she'd be released sometime in the future, and there would be a follow-up. There'd be further testing to be done. There would be uh, places that you would go to uh, get further testing. It, when you get released from the hospital for mental health problems, there's no follow-up. There's no health care after the fact. And I think that that's one of the reasons why so many people get frustrated and complete suicide. It's, it, it's just terrible that we need to move things forward. I know Mr. Seuss wants to say a few things. Uh, he's helped me tremendously on this. And uh, I would ask that he be allowed to speak. Did you want to make that motion, Councillor? Yes. Okay, motion by Councillor uh, Campbell, second by Councillor Dabrowski that Mr. Seuss be allowed to speak. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you for that. Mr. Okay, Mayor, Mr. I'd like to speak when Mr. Seuss is done. Okay, thank you. Mr. Seuss, are you there? Can you hear us? 
I am, thank you. Okay, we hear you fine. Welcome to the meeting. So thank you for your indulgence, Chair, and thank you to Council for allowing me to speak on this very important issue. I want to begin by thanking Councillor Campbell from the bottom of my heart for working on this with me. And together we were able to come up with this motion that addresses the issue. And, you know, a lot of people would say that a state of emergency is drastic. A lot of people would say that a state of emergency, you know, is just not practical. But here's the reality, as Councillor Campbell rightfully mentioned. The reality is that from January to September of this year, there were 475 overdoses reported by Niagara EMS. That is up from the previous 335 that Councillor Campbell mentioned in 2019 from January to June. 625 homeless residents. That includes 144 homeless children. Now we haven't got an accurate count on that. That's why the numbers are from 2018 because the region was supposed to do a program called Niagara Counts 2020. Of course, like most things, that was postponed by COVID-19. So the, this is what we have to go by. Now, there are some precedents of states of emergency being called. The Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority recently declared a state of emergency on climate, and two Ontario First Nations communities declared an emergency over water quality. So a state of emergency is an effective way to shape the debate in terms of allocation of resources to the issue. Everybody acknowledges that there's a problem and this is the way to inspire the debate. And from many, many politicians that I've spoken to on the lower tier, you know, they're in support of this move as well. I mean, Councillor Campbell and I could talk to you about just how many people, you know, over social media and who phoned us and who emailed us have supported this move. If this isn't a state of emergency, I don't know what it is, Council. We need to we need to take action on this. We need to get the region listening. You know, Councillor Campbell rightfully said it's about it's like the revolving door of services because we just don't have enough resources to address this issue. And if you talk to a lot of the workers, if you talk to a lot of the workers uh, who work in, you know, these advocacy groups and these service groups, they're burnt out. You know, they are dealing with the bulk of these issues and it, it's overwhelming. You look at sh shelter occupancy operating at 109.4%, okay? Encampments in Niagara Falls, you know, in the United States, they declared a state of emergency on addictions federally. And in one year, related or not, it dropped 5%, the reported overdoses. So, I mean, this is something that we should be doing. And it's going to go to the prime minister's office. It's going to go to the premier's office. They dedicated, when COVID-19 emergency was called, they dedicated resources to the COVID-19 emergency. I want the chance for more resources to be dedicated for these issues because each one of those statistics council is a person. Each one of those statistics, that person has a family and everybody has been touched by this issue in some way, shape or form. So once again, I hope that tonight council will ask the region to declare a state of emergency on the issue. Councillor Campbell, if you're listening right now, you inspire me. And I am so proud of Councillor Campbell for helping me achieve this because this has been a two year fight for me to get this done. And tonight, I hope we can take the first step because once it gets forwarded to the other lower tier municipalities, you will see the biggest movement that you will ever see on this issue because it is not just one person who is for taking action. Thank you for your indulgence, Council. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Sues. Uh, I know Councillor Iannone, you wanted to speak? You're muted, Councillor. 
sorry about that. I, I'd like to thank them both for bringing this to the table. Um, I know well Councillor Campbell's um, journey. Um, five years ago, my sister died of a fentanyl overdose um, after struggling for years of addiction. And it is devastating to a whole household. It's still devastating to us. I, my mother, I don't believe my mother will ever get over it. And that's after years of trying to find both mental health and addiction services that would be ongoing. Um, this is long overdue. I hope we don't just pass this resolution and not force it through every level of government that we can so that other families are not sitting at home mourning the loss of family members that I, I think we did everything we could as a family. I, I, we, we, you try to do everything. You try to get them help. You try to get them mental services help. You try to get them into NAAA. You try to get them into Homewood. You put them, you go with them through addiction services and all of those things do not help. Um, it is an endless circle and it, it sometimes ends up devastating as it did with us. And I, I really like to see other families not have to go through that again. So it's not as simple as us passing it here. We need to be relentless once we pass it here and not and not wait to see how other municipalities or other levels of government deal with this, but make them deal with it because they just simply don't want to listen to us anymore. And I, and I think a lot of parents, sisters, daughters, mothers, brothers, fathers are um, hopefully going to be saved for the, from this initiative because it really is devastating. So thank you to both Councillor Campbell and Stephen Seuss. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, so we have a resolution. Uh, Councillor Campbell, would you like to move it? I would so move the resolution, Your Worship. Okay. We've got a cell phone going off. Uh, second. I would second. Okay, uh, we've got a second. Okay, okay. Uh, we got a, count, a seconder by Councillor Peter Angelo. Thank you. Um, anybody want to speak to this further? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor? Okay, and of course, that's unanimous. Thank you very much, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Council. Yeah, good luck. Good luck with Helga. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm going to switch seats here with Councillor Peter Angelo. Or, yep. Yeah, Your Worship, I was going to ask if you can just stay there because of okay. COVID. I think it's probably best. If, okay. If do you want to chair it from there? No, no. I think it's probably best if you just do it from there, Your Worship. I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, for the time being, I think that's the way it's going to be. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to keep the chair. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so count, our uh, Councillor Peter Angelo is budget chair, and uh, we do have a capital budget presentation. So I guess uh, I'll let you, Councillor Peter Angelo, if you want to introduce uh, the, the budget at least and introduce uh, our CFO. Uh, sure, Your Worship. Um, uh, Ms. Clark is going to give a council a presentation on... I guess the hopeful 2021 capital budget. So I'll pass it over to Ms. Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Peter Angelo. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we hear you great. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm actually going to co do the presentation with James Dowling. He's our new manager of capital accounting. I just started in September with the city, and he's going to start off the slideshow. Um, so that next year when I'm on maternity leave, he can do it all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Welcome, started. James. Welcome, James. Yes. Thank you. I'm just going to start and say, um, I think this is probably the earliest that we've ever brought a capital presentation to council. I'm not sure if you've had one in November. If not the earliest, maybe a tie. And I really have to thank the departments for their cooperation on, on getting it here this early. And my staff, especially um, James, Jennifer, and Lisa for um, helping pull it all together um, so we could get this to you early and hopefully get a head start on getting some of our tenders out the door. So without further ado, I'm going to attempt to screen share and run this slideshow and James will um, take over. Great. So I uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen now. Pardon me? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thanks Tiffany, hope you all can hear me. Um, I also wanted to just quickly start off with a thank you echoing what Tiffany mentioned. Um, you know, big thanks to Tiffany, Lisa, Jennifer, and my staff um, for all their hard work. Um, maybe we broke a record with how early this one is, is being presented and that would be great. Um, I'll jump right into things. So um, if we don't mind, let's jump to the next slide. 
Perfect. So today's presentation is going to provide an overview of the 2021 capital budget. Um, the budget details are available on the city's website for members of the public. We uploaded budget details to the councillor's iPads on November 5th, and we also hosted a drop-in session with senior staff and members of council on November 10th um, to address any questions that had ar arisen by then. The proposed capital budget is fully funded based on available funding sources, and we are seeking approval for the 2021 capital budget this evening. Next slide, please. So we did borrow this from the city of St. Catharines, but we still think it's a really good depiction of how the operating and capital budgets work together in unison with other, other funding sources like debt and reserve funds. In strategic instances for large assets, debt can be a really useful tool um, to help spread the cost over the life of the asset. Um, with current interest rates at an all-time low, it makes debt a more affordable option than potentially in years past. Next slide, please. So staff were asked to prioritize their budget submissions using the following criteria. So they were ranked high, medium, low. High priority pro projects are shovel ready and could carry negative consequences if not started in 2021. Medium priority projects are important projects that may require a little bit of further planning and they could start or continue in 2021 or the following year. And low priority projects are identified but not necessarily urgent. Um, and there's really no negative impact if they don't start um, in 2021 or the following year, um, but it does identify the upcoming need. So with the smaller funding envelope this year compared to um, prior years, high priority projects were reviewed in detail um, with only a few medium priority projects considered in certain circumstances. Next slide, please. So quickly going over the capital budgeting process, um, typically it takes place from August to November each year. Um, departments start by reviewing their capital plans, um, in the late summer and early fall, the directors will then submit their prioritized list for further consideration. Uh, meetings, and, meetings and discussions are booked with the CAO, the treasurer, departmental representatives, and our capital accounting staff to confirm our understanding um, and review the prioritization based on the available funding. We then prepare a final list of proposed projects which are likely to be funded, and this is reviewed with departments. This sort of functions as a bit of a last call for any last minute changes or revisions. And finally, finance staff um, will finalize the funding, prepare the budget documentations for council and the public, and finally present to you today. So um, from here, I'd like to pass things back over to Tiffany, and she's gonna dive into some more of the details of the 2021 proposed capital budget. Thanks, James. Everyone can still hear me? Yeah. <coughs> so uh, I'm gonna take a look at our pre-approved projects. Um, I mean, I've only been doing the capital budget. This is the third time, but this is a huge list. Uh, it makes up half of our budget ask. And a large reason for that is the ICIT funding approvals that we received throughout um, 2020, where council approved projects to start with the funding allocations to occur in the 2021 capital budget. So it's a great news story, because in most cases that as uh, projects were about 73% of the dollars are funded by federal and provincial grants. Uh, it just resulted in, in a huge ask and a huge amount of money to um, find dollars for. So uh, we've got the list here. I don't think I'm going to read every single one. If there are questions about it, let me know. What we've done is put the date on here, the date of approval, and then the authority. So either the budget it was approved in or the council report, just for your reference. Um, sometimes it's good to jog our memories. As some of these things are going back to December, actually, 2019. So... Um, if you have any questions about any of those, happy to take them. It's actually a two-page list, so I'll just quickly flip over to page two. Um, the only two projects that, that push into 2022 were already approved in 2019, and that, of course, is the water meter program, four-year program, uh, as well as the um, veteran and war dead monument restoration was a five-year program with the federal government where they uh, give us 20000 and we put in 20000 and then just quickly uh, on the water meter program, I uh, forgot to include a slide on it, but I wanted to share a couple stats on that that I was given um, our manager of environmental services, James Stika. So we're um, about 61% of the way through the water meter program, which is great. As we're just wrapping up year two, we're actually ahead of schedule. So um, it's possible we might be able to wrap this up by next year, but we will still be funding it into 2022. The funding will be spread out into four years, but 
we're moving right along and things are going really well despite having um, a few months delay for COVID. So I think that's a good news story. Um, and certainly if there are any questions about the water meter program, I'm gonna defer those definitely to Eric Nickel. <laughs> But just wanted to touch on the progress on that because I think that's that's great. So it's just a little summary on the pre-approved projects. So they do total 23.4 million. It is almost half of our budget. Uh, it's not even a budget ask. You've already approved them. I'm just telling you the recommended funding sources at this point. This is a breakdown of um, by department. So you can see transit is huge, 12 million dollars, and that was. Uh, mostly just all ICIP uh, funded projects, except for 2.2 million uh, in two new buses. And then these are the funding sources I'm proposing for the pre-approved project. So we've got a million as part of the $4 million transfer from operating, we've got 1.3 million coming from sewer, 2.8 from water. Uh, capital SBRs, most of that, about a million of that, is going towards the water meter program. Um, the previous treasurer had actually put away about $4 million for that, so we've been spreading that over the four years, which is great. So debentures, we've got um, $5.5 million, and that is, we are proposing a debenture for the service center costs of $2.1 million, the buses of $2.2 million, uh, that the city purchased conventional buses and the city's portion of the ICIP funded buses, six buses, which is 1.2 million with the feds making up 73% of that. So that totals about 5.5 million. Um, an important consideration about the buses, which total about three and a half million, those will eventually, uh, that whole debenture will eventually migrate to the region. Uh, we did put them on notice that we were planning to debenture our portion of that. So they are aware that um, if and when any sort of regionalization occurs with transit, that debt will migrate there. Uh, oh, sorry, just... Uh, I sorry, have Ms. a question. Yeah? Yeah. Um, Councilor? Yes, while you're uh, um, talking about the uh, capital budget, uh, could you please, or probably Eric Nickel, to uh, respond to the heavy construction association of the region with respect to capital budget and calling contracts i guess they're saying like everybody else they're having problems uh surviving during this pandemic and uh i wonder if somebody could at least uh, respond to their concerns and uh if there is anything we can do to um, make them feel better about our uh, capital budget. Eric, or, yeah. Mr. Mayor, can I just compound on that? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't, I can't see anybody. Um, okay, so I, I got a call today from, from I'll just say H. Kern. Um, and they were asking that we not approve the capital budget tonight and refer it so that they can come and make a Zoom presentation at the soonest council meeting that they can. Um, they would like to make a presentation to council. They stressed to me that they employ 6,000 um, tradespeople um, and a lot of them directly work for the city and or the region. And they would like the opportunity before we pass this capital budget to make a presentation to us. Who did you say that so, they are? It's the heavy construction industry. Oh, okay. They're, um, they, they would like us to defer the budget to the next meeting or refer passing the budget to the next meeting so that they could make a Zoom presentation before we do. So okay. I just wanted to put that out there also. Thank you for that, Councillor. I've got Councillor Cario. Councillor Cario. Well, on that issue, Your Worship, I can't support the Heavy Construction Association coming to our meeting to tell us how much we can afford to spend on capital projects. Really? I'm sorry, but uh, the council, the staff, can do the same job that they've done for the last 50 years without someone coming to our meeting that wants work and telling us that they need more work and maybe we could increase our budget because that's what they would want to do. So I, I cannot support that. Okay. When, the that. when the time comes, we'll vote. We'll do it in a democratic way. Oh. Councillor Thompson, did you want to continue with that or did you want to hear from Eric? Um, yeah, I think uh, what I was asking uh, is... Microphone, to, uh, we got to hit your microphone. <laughs> uh, is to have 
Eric respond to it because there's a, a request here and I'm sure he has uh, uh, some valid comments to make and, uh, and I'd like to hear them. Uh, Mr. Nickel, uh, did you want to weigh in on this fun topic? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, it is an item later in the agenda, item 9.2, so I'd be happy to provide comments now, um, or if we would like to follow the order of business, then uh, we can have the, the uh, Director of Finance continue and address that item later. Um, Why don't you do it now, just oh. since we've had uh, three councillors comment on it? Of course. So the, the Heavy Construction Association is obviously uh, a, uh, a large partner with us in delivering the construction of our infrastructure projects. We know that uh, we have an asset management plan that has funding challenges, as do most municipalities. And we've communicated that already to the Heavy Construction Association. Um, their interests are um, that they keep their workers busy. And our interests are that we find a, a balance between affordability and our infrastructure needs. So what we've done in our budget this year is prioritize, uh, as the director and the manager have mentioned, Prioritize items that are of high importance and those that are maybe less important um, as we try to reach all of those balancing pressures. So what we've done this year is communicated to the Heavy Construction Association the projects that are in the queue and those that are on their way out the door in next year if Council approves this budget. So we're trying to work with them and give them as much information as we can to help them set up their staffing models appropriately. Um, so I, I, I do believe that there's some merit in their request that they want to make sure that infrastructure funding does not get reduced. That's important to me that we have high quality infrastructure to service our residents. But again, it's the balancing act of infrastructure spending and affordability. Uh, and I will say that I'm, I'm confident that this budget put together by uh, director is uh, um, suitable to make sure that we're, we're finding the right um, fit for that balance of affordability and infrastructure needs this year. Councillor Thompson, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think uh, that you're going to have an uh, ongoing dialogue and uh, discussion with the, the group. Is that what you're s suggesting? Mr. Nickel? Yeah, th through you, Mr. Mayor, the group has asked myself and our colleagues to, um, to meet with them, and representatives from the public works officials have done so, and we've provided them with our schedules of projects and anticipated spending. Uh, so we've done as much as we can to help them out and give them an idea of what the, the short-term forecast looks like. Um, and we'll continue to work with them on any um, other updates we can provide. Okay, I had the letter on the agenda, but also had a couple of calls. So as long as you're dealing with them and responding, I, I think that's uh, appropriate. We all know what situation we're in financially, and uh, we have to, uh, uh, you know, the restaurants, the hotels, everybody's in trouble. So thank you, and just as long, I think you give me the right answer. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so can we continue on, uh, Ms. Clark? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Perfect. So uh, we just went over the debentures and then we just want to touch on um, the federal provincial grants, the 9.5 million there. That is the ICIP funding we receive for various projects, uh, the bulk of them transit and of course the Drummond Road project um, that we found out about midsummer. And then the federal provincial gas tax, we're uh, proposing to use provincial gas tax to cover the city's portion of all the transit projects. So really the, the transit projects are funded mostly um, by grants with the exception of the buses being the, the debentures. So all in all, that's the 23.4 million of funding uh, allocations for the pre-approved projects with of course the 3 million councils already committed for the last year of the water meter program. So. This is a separate recommendation when I get to the last slide that council will um, either approve or not approve the, the recommended funding uh, sources for the pre-approved projects. And uh, now we'll move on uh, to the new asks. 
So new capital asks total $24.6 million. Um, we've broken it out here by department just for interest sake. Uh, as usual, obviously Municipal Works uh, makes up the bulk of the asks with um, the building department coming in second. Just uh, moving along, uh, Council's had an opportunity to um, view the detailed budget information. Uh, I believe it was um, a week or two ago we got that into Council's hands. Uh, they were also afforded an opportunity to have a Q&A uh, session with staff on Tuesday, November 10th, and we had four councillors attend, uh, which is great. And hopefully all your questions uh, were answered there that, that you might have had at that point in time. So here's the recommended uh, funding for the capital budget request, again, totaling $24.6 million. So uh, we've got to the rest of the transfer from operating, which is proposed to be about $4.1 million this year. Uh, transfer from the libraries operating. This comes from their own budget. So the library, obviously, council's aware. You, they submit a budget to council. Council approves it. Transfer from sewer, 3.19. Water, 2.1. Uh, a little bit from our capital reserves. Uh, a million of that is for fleet replacement. So council knows we do the internal rent rates, and in it we raise money for fleet replacement. So any surplus in the fleet area is put into a fleet replacement reserve for the next year. And of course, this is really just a drop in the bucket for fleet. Uh, council may remember last year, Eric Nickel, our director of municipal works, kind of gave a, a highlight of fleet indicating the massive backlog of vehicles we need to purchase. Um, we really should be spending at least 3.2 million a year on fleet, but due to constraints this year, we, we just can't. So um, we've got the 1.3 million. OLG, that's a sad looking line this year. We don't have uh, any funding for OLG this year. Normally we would see about 10 million there. And to be quite frank and set the stage for next year, I'm not confident we'll have anything next year as well. So, so we'll be looking at another tough budget year for, for capital dollars for OLG. Um, reserve funds, that is the library's reserve funds. So the library funds most of their own projects through their own reserves. And then we're using our DCs. So we really dug deep on this budget, knowing we had no OLG dollars, which we've been so fortunately blessed with the last seven years. Uh, and we tried to focus on DC eligible projects so we could still try to put together a decent looking capital budget. Um, and I'm quite proud of how much we did get funded given, given the funding constraints. Uh, we're proposing more debentures again, 4.26 million. A large part of this is the ask from the uh, additional funding for the service center. Um, this is a, it, that would make the service center debenture about 4.9 million. Uh, I'll get to that in a future slide. And it coincides, uh, when we would get the debenture, it would coincide with when debentures are falling off for us. So there'd be no impact on the operating budget as one set of principal and interest falls off, we would fill it up with the principal and interest from this debenture. Uh, staff did a fantastic job going through the federal gas tax funding and figuring out um, all available funds from, say, projects that were committed that came in under over what was available to be committed. So we've used 5.8 million of uh, federal provincial gas tax funds. And then external contributions of uh, 815,000 there, that is uh, mostly the region's CSO program. So. That is funding that is not confirmed, and if we are unable to get that funding, uh, staff will come back to council and have to ask for a different source. So no projects would move ahead until um, any unconfirmed funding sources are are firmed up, and uh, if they're not, we'll be back in front of your in front of you with a report on that. So those are the proposed funding sources for the new asks. Um, on here and then overall adding the two the pre-approved and the new asks together you're looking at about a 48 million dollar budget um, of course last year was i believe around the 83 million dollar mark and one of the highest ever uh, included two anomalies being fire station seven and the cultural hub was about 20 million of that so um, this is definitely one of our lower budgets but last year was a, a record high that we was not sustainable for us so this just breaks out the overall budget by department again, and then we've got another slide that breaks out the overall um, funding for both pre-approved and um, new asks combined together. Uh, so debt. So, I mean, I don't have to tell council, you understand the reasons for taking on debt. It's an amazing um, 
interest rate year at the moment. We actually just got the first draw of our debenture for our cultural hub of 8.4 million this year at 1.99%, which is unreal. Um, we'll draw the second part of that uh, at the end of the project. So probably not till 2022 when we know the final costs. Um, so that just obviously spreads the capital costs over the useful life of the project. And then we're taking advantage of those low interest rates and we're timing it where debentures are already coming off, uh, to an end, maturing uh, in our operating budget so that there is uh, minimal to no impact on the operating budget and, and you wouldn't see a difference from the debt standpoint. So that, that's a good debt management strategy to have and that's what the staff have been working on. So within the debt requests, um, which had totaled uh, $9.8 million there, we do have uh, 4.97 for the service center. We have the Oaks Park improvements at 1.42 million. That is for the Canada Summer Games. Uh, our, stra our policy for debt is generally not to debenture till the end of a project when we know the true costs. And I'll be honest, I'm hoping by the time the Oaks Park one is done, we will have OLG money. And I don't really want to debenture that, but if we have to, we must. But Council can always decide later to switch out the funding for something else. Um, from a cash flow standpoint, we would pay for it now, but uh, if come the time we're ready to venture for Oaks Park, we have a different source we want to allocate to it, we certainly could do that as well. And then the transit bus replacements, the 3.45 million, uh, again, that would transfer over to the region if and when uh, transit became regional. Uh, so these, the next two slides are, um, but for the 2022 capital budget. So I've included in this presentation because it's capital related, but I want to clarify, I had a really good question from a counselor about, you know, why wasn't that in the package for the 2021 budget? And I just want to explain, I see that completely separately. So the 2021 budget is its own recommendation. And this is a recommendation on a pre-approval for 2022. So because buses and fire trucks take a year from the time we order to the time we get them in and actually pay for them, we're asking for permission now from council to order three new buses. Uh, they are partially uh, growth related. So some funding dollars will come from DCs and we would be ordering them now, but not paying for them until 2022. So we would allocate the funding in the 2022 capital budget and they will show up there in the pre-approved slides. Um, then we've got one fire tanker six. We are hoping to also get approval from council to order one now with payment in the 2022 capital budget. So each one of those is a separate recommendation. So council can deal with each one uh, on its own. So here's the recommendation. So the first part is council approved the funding sources that total $23.4 million for the pre-approved projects that contained uh, recommendations for funding to be determined during the 2021 capital budget process. So again, this is projects council approved mid-year 2020 uh, after the 2020 budget was already done for staff to go ahead and start and st uh, finance staff to get back to council with what funding source we would use. Then we're asking that council approve the new budget expenditure requests of 24.6 million with the proposed funding as shown in the slideshow. Uh, third one is council approve the ordering of 340 foot buses in 2021 with payment and delivery of those buses to incur in 2022. That's a total uh, of 1.95 million and again, partially growth related. So some would come from DC dollars. And then that council approved the ordering of one fire tanker in 2021 to replace tanker six with payment and delivery of the tanker expected to occur in 2022 for a total of approximately $650,000. So um, that's it for the recommendations. And are there any questions? Ms. Clark, uh, any questions of counsel for Ms. Clark? Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, overall, I don't mind the budget. I think it's a good budget. Um, I think we should be moving forward uh, with our capital budget. I, I, I just have one concern, which I, I, I've already mentioned to Ms. Clark and, and to our CAO, Mr. Todd, and that's just in regards to our transfer from our operating budget, Your Worship. Right now, we have uh, just under $4.2 million that we transfer from our operating budget to our capital budget. And that's something that happens every single year. Our operating budget always funds our capital budget. 
Uh, this coming year, though, I honestly believe is going to be a little bit different in the sense that I've already heard Ms. Clark uh, address the OLG funding, uh, the funding that we got in 2020, and also the anticipated funding that we're going to get in 2021, and neither one of us really believe that it's going to be there. With that said, our operating budget does rely on OLG funds to the tune of $6 million a year. So to uh, start off our operating budget at a $6 million deficit as opposed to uh, perhaps not transferring that money from operating into capital and starting off at a $1.8 million deficit, to me is much more um, achievable in the sense of uh, delivering a budget that is acceptable to our ratepayers. So um, with that said, Your Worship, uh, perhaps a long story, but what I would like to see is the transfer from operating just be suspended at this point. And I'm not saying that we need to uh, chop it or that we need to get rid of it. I think it can still happen, but I'd rather see the full picture in the sense that I need to see what the operating budget is before I approve that transfer. So I know Ms. Clark has a, a slide for council, and that slide I think is gonna go through perhaps some of the projects that will be affected if the funding doesn't go through. And again, I'm not saying that you know uh, we need to commit right now to that funding not going through, but I would like to put it on suspension just for the time being until I actually see the operating budget. I think we need the full picture, Your Worship. I mean, you know, more than ever, and I know in different periods, I guess we've talked about zero budgets, but Your Worship, right now, I believe that we have a lot of ratepayers that are struggling, uh, whether that's homeowners or whether that's businesses. So I, I don't want to put the call out too early, but I certainly would support a zero budget. And supporting a zero budget means that we're going to have to make up a pretty big hole without having that $6 million OLG funding. And this would be a good start, Your Worship. So if we are going to approve the capital budget, the only caveat I would have is that we put the transfer from operating on suspension until such time that we approve the operating budget. Yeah, is that a motion? And I'll, I'll make that motion, Your Worship, absolutely. And I'll second that. Okay, so we've got a, I've got you, Councillor uh, uh, Ioni. So motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson. Uh, that we approve the capital budget with the proviso that we suspend the transfer from uh, operating to capital until we see the, the operating budget. Is that right, Councillor? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. And I would have to echo the, the thoughts that there's an expectation. This has been a tough year for a lot of people. We've got to do all we can do to keep uh, taxes uh, down. So I like the direction of that. Uh, Councillor Iannone? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I participated on one of the Zoom meetings the other day with, with our senior staff, and that question was asked to Tiffany, and her answer to us was, that's woefully low, and that we need to be transferring more from operating to our capital. Um, I'd like to see us to, to defer this capital budget, particularly, A, to allow um, the heavy industry to speak to us. I don't think it, it hurts anybody to just listen. Um, B, I am very concerned about the 4.9 million going into the service center. I've made that pretty clear in emails. I did not get a response to my second email to, to Eric today, but I know that I will um, so that I can understand more what's going on over there. And, and third, our, our head of finance is telling us 4.2 million is not even enough. So I don't, and, and that was enforced by our CAO on the, on the Zoom call. So I'm not sure whether this is fiscally the way for us to go. And, and I would have liked to have more conversation on this, perhaps know that that motion was coming because it's contrary to what staff is telling us. So if we, so if we delete that transfer from operating, what do we have to take out of this capital budget? Because then we're not, if we're taking that money out, we don't have the money to approve everything that we have in here. So we can't even pass this tonight if that's what's if that's what we're going to do. So maybe uh, Ms. Clark can answer some of those questions because she made it very clear that we cannot cut that operating money. Well, I'm sorry, Councillor. Right, exactly. So, so Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, for clarity, is not suggesting that we delete the transfer. He's suggesting we delay the transfer until we deal with the operating budget and see the impact well, that it's going to have there. Well, Mr. Mayor, and we, we've often said around this table that we like to have the operating, capital and operating so we can see how one, 
how one balances the other. And I think that conversation was had the other day at Zoom. I'd like to have them both to know how one affects the other. Um, if we're going to delay that transfer, why do we have to approve this capital budget tonight? Okay, well, that's the motion that he's put on the table tonight. To delay the transfer and to approve the, the capital budget or just to delay the transfer? No, to, to approve the capital, but delay the transfer. I, and, and see, I'm watching Ms. Clark shake her head no, and to me, we should be listening to our staff. I'm sorry, you're, you're saying who shake their head no? I'm watching Ms. Clark shake her oh, head Clark. no. Oh, okay, I'm and, sorry. And she, and she is who, who spent two hours explaining to us the other night, the other day, how that should not happen. Okay. So I'd like to hear from her also. Okay, so first I've got Councillor uh, Cario, and then I've got the CAO would like to speak. So, Councillor Cario. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I, I had the same concern about transferring from the operating budget as Councillor Peter Angelo and Councillor Thompson. And I think that the staff can come up with another way to do it. We can, we can venture more money. We can take more money out of reserves by by suspending it and giving us a chance to look at our operating budget. We already know our operating budget is going to be bad. We know it. We don't have the money. And we people can't pay anymore. We don't have the casino money. It's not going to be better. There's going to be a bunch of reassessments coming forward. I, I've had this conversation with Ms. Clark before. We know that the operating budget is going to be bad. So we just don't know how bad it's going to be and how we're going to meet this zero that we'd like to see but there's other alternatives that's why i'd like to see the, bu the budget go forward and they can come up with some alternatives either we debenture more money or we take more money out of reserves or what are there other uh creative accounting ways they come up with so i'm going to support the motion and i don't want to defer it i want to support it i'm not interested in here in the construction association okay thank you for that uh, uh mr cao hi mr mayor thank you um and through you uh Councilor Kerry has repeated a few of the things I wanted to say, but uh, once we commit to the budget and the projects, uh, if Council decides at a future date not to fund the transfer from operating, then you'd have to look at other options. And Councilor Kerry has identified a few. It may be debt, uh, but those projects would be in the loop. With respect to the Construction Association, I think one of the things that you could do tonight to help them more than anything is get projects gets approved, get them on the counter, get them out the door and get people working. Because there's several projects there that could be wintertime projects. And the sooner we can get those tenders out the door, that's how you're gonna help the construction association at this point in time. Thank you for that. Anybody else, uh, anybody else on council wanna comment? <clears throat> Councilor Coco and then Dabrowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to staff for um, sitting with us for those two hours of all of the questions and a lot of great explanations came through and understanding. Um, I did have some notations um, that came out of that. So when I was going through the budget, um, there's, there's one section um, that has 10 different projects that have increased since we've last um, approved them. And it comes up to $7.4 million. So my concern was that instead of hearing about them at budget time, that we'd be updated throughout the year when there's problems, when things come up. And, you know, things happen in construction. Something happens and there's increased costs. Um, I do understand that it is a discussion at budget time, but it's really hard to have a discussion on multiple items when you only have two hours for a whole budget. And I would prefer to have discussions on specific topics so we know what we're approving and why it was increased. Um, that's a lot of money, $7.4 million. Um, I really liked how the staff increased all of the information on the budget sheets for us. They, they gave us where the money was coming from, uh, the expectations of ICIP, grants. There was a lot of information. It was a lot better than last year and, and the year before that. So that was really good. I did speak with Ms. Clark about participatory budgeting. We talked about that last year, and she said due to COVID and us whittling down our budget so much, there just was not a, a way to participate, um, for our residents to participate, but to look towards next year to do that because it's really important that our residents know our challenges of how much money we have and why we can't spend money on certain things. Um, one of the other things that 
a lot of our residents are talking about is they see our large budget and they wonder why we're we're spending money on certain projects that maybe could be postponed so I'm really happy to hear the discussion about getting ground ground ready projects that we could do in the winter time I know the construction industry is um, concerned about that our budget shouldn't reflect their concerns but I think it is important that we look at that um, I do think that there are some projects within there that maybe we should look at and say, are they really important at this time? Because I did question the operating budget going over to the um, transfer to operating, and that is a lot of money that's coming out of there. And I would prefer that we deal with it all at once. I understand that we want to get some ground uh, ready, shovel ready projects to go, but it's hard to say, okay, well, we'll talk about it later. We might debenture, we might do this, we might do that. I would prefer that we look at the capital and the operating together. Um, and I know we also had some discussions about consulting fees. If you look at the consulting fees, they're very, very high. And Mr. Nichols explained about how, uh, why we would use consultants compared to why we use in-house staff. So I think there's a, a, a debate out there that we could be looking at using more staff or maybe even hiring certain staff that uh, we're not paying those big consulting fees. I know there's pros and cons on each, but I think it's important at this time in uh, economic challenges that we look where all the, we, we can be cutting the budget. And um, another thing I wanted to bring up, I know that there, on other councils they have budget committees. And I guess the way that it works in the city of Niagara Falls is that our staff and probably through our budget chair uh, come to council and I'm wondering if there's a different opportunity for councillors to be involved earlier in the budget like in other cities where they actually have a budget committee there's lots of discussion they put it together and they bring it to council so I just wanted to put that out there as well <clears throat> we used to at one time have uh, corporate services and community services uh, our council and then they just found there was a lot of duplication and overlap and the same questions would get asked a second time so everyone said we all want to be a part of the whole process and that's why we ended up and since we have a smaller council only eight of us plus the mayor compared to some other councils bigger uh, that's how we got to how we're doing it now I mean you can always bring ideas forward obviously but that's a little bit of the history because I know when I started that's how it was as well so appreciate that. Um, Ms. Clark, did you have any comments on uh, any of the suggestions made by Councillor Lococo? Uh, just by Council, through you, Mr. Chair, just the ones by <laughs> Councillor Lococo? Yeah, I just mean, is there, I don't know if you had anything to add or I don't know, because I wasn't there for your discussion, so I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say or no. No, I think she's done a good summary of the discussion. Um, I think those are all valid comments and, and she's right, we weren't able to the participatory budgeting together for this year. Uh, we just don't have the, the pots of money available for residents to play with, I suppose. Don't make it look like we have pots of money to play with. That doesn't sound good. I, I do have comments on the rest when it's my turn. Okay. Uh, if you want, but I believe we've got a motion ready to go. Is there something else you wanted to add to it? Uh, not to the motion, but I was going to address Councillor Peter Angelo's comments on the OLG funding because I think what I said was misinterpreted. Okay, well then, so, if, yeah. Yeah, so um, when I said there'd be no OLG dollars, I meant for capital. I, I am hopeful the casino will open at some point in 2021, so I'm not at all anticipating a, a $6 million hit to our operating budget. I just wanted to clarify that, that my projection isn't that there are zero OLG dollars for 2021 that there won't be any available for capital. So we usually have six million for capital and four for the police, or sorry, six million for um, operating and four for the police with the remaining about 10 million left over for capital. It would be my opinion, we, we probably won't have any left over for capital. So I just wanted to clear that up. Um, I do have uh, the slide like um, Councilor Peter Angelo mentioned, um, I'm slightly confused how we would approve the capital budget but suspend the transfer because in my opinion then you're not approving all the projects that had transfers from operating. Um, so I don't know if you want to see the list of all the projects that have transfers from operating if that would be helpful before you made your motion to know which projects you're essentially not approving at this time because some of them can't be funded with different pots of money, including debt. Um, they'd have to be something that has a, a longer lifespan, at least five to 10 years. 
so staff could certainly be creative and come back with more debt options and we would actually love to lose use more debt um, historically this council's been debt adverse so that's music to my ears if you'd like to see more debt options put into the budget uh, but some projects just quite frankly wouldn't be eligible for debt so why don't we I think uh, based on the direction of council why don't we we're, we're gonna go forward with the motion and see where that goes uh, because I think they're curious to hear your take on the debt and or the debenturing, uh, or I'm sorry, or the reserves rather, uh, and seeing what your solutions would be to that gap of that transfer and how we might be able to do that. So I think they still, but they still, for the sake of the rest of the capital budget, they want to make sure that everybody gets the go forward direction to go out and get your tenders and go and do what you need to do. So I think, uh, not that they, I don't think we need to see the projects. It's not about that. It's just about how we're funding them. I think that's what the question is right now. Through you, Mr. Mayor, then. To be clear, though, you're, you're not approving the ones with, with operating dollars then, correct? You're approving everything that doesn't have operating that's dollars right. associated right? to it. That's, that's right. That's right. Yet. Further information. Yeah. Yes. Yep, Councillor Peter Angela. Yeah, and if I can just be a little clearer, I guess to me, uh, the operating budget is what drives the tax rate. So um, without knowing what the operating budget is right now, it's difficult for me to want to transfer almost $4.2 million from the operating budget to the capital budget because I know that that's going to have an impact on the tax mm -hmm. rate. Um, so, I mean, if it's actually not possible to suspend the transfer from the operating budget, then I guess the entire capital budget would, would be deferred. I'd rather not see that happen. I'd rather see the capital budget be approved and some of the projects, uh, as mentioned, get out the door because it's very timely that we can get some out in the winter time. That would be my preference. Um, if that's not possible, then, uh, then I guess I will take my motion off the floor. I would think that it would be possible, Your Worship, uh, just suspending that transfer from the operating budget. So maybe if I can get uh, maybe a response either from Ms. Clark or Mr. Todd. Um, so the, the, the idea of the motion is to move the capital budget just with the uh, exclusion of the transfer part. Is that helpful, or what would your preference be versus that, versus deferring it all? Well, Mr. Mayor, if, if we were to approve the whole budget, uh, what you're saying is that we're going to have to come back with options on how the other $4 million would be funded if the transfer does not happen this year. So, um, you know, if that's the motion, then we'll have to have some discussion on where those funding sources might be. Yep. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Lococo and Cario. Thank, Thank you. you for that, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Oh, CEO. Sorry. Sorry. I, I was just wondering about the transfer to operating. If we just don't cover those projects and we take $4.1 million out of the, the capital, if we still go ahead with everything else, I'm wondering if we should wait because maybe we want to change the rest of the budget if we don't have the $4.1 million and not just those projects. Like we might say, okay, rather than put um, money into this project, we might put it somewhere else. Would we change our priorities of the rest of the budget if we remove the $4.1 million and not those specific projects? Would our other um, items, prior, our priorities change? So we'll just get on that the point. Yeah, the mover to answer that. Yes, yeah, please. just on that point, Your Worship, perhaps you can ask Mr. Todd to answer that. Um, uh, my understanding is that a lot, of, a lot of the projects are very specific to uh, different pieces of funding, whether it be gas tax or development charges or, or other means of funding. So perhaps Mr. Todd can answer that. Mr. Todd, could you answer well, that? Well, and, that, and that's absolutely correct because there's different pots of money, and that'll be the challenge for us to come back on the $4 million because there are different pots and eligibility for those pots of money based on what some of the projects are. For example, whether it's development charges, whether it's gas tax, um, and that'll be the challenge. But um, if council is going to and would like to approve, we, we would like to have the budget approved, um, but um, we'll just have to report back on what some of those al al other alternative funding sources may be. I, I would not recommend that we start trying to reallocate and, uh, you know, look at, um, you know, changing priorities and projects. Uh, I, I think it's just really coming up with what that dilemma is on the funding source. And at the end of the day, 
depending on where we end up with the operating budget uh, discussions, uh, you know, there's a possibility that transfer still can happen. Uh, that'll be something that'll be looked at when we see the full results of the operating budget sometime early in the new year. Okay, does that answer your question, uh, Councillor? And I had, I'm sorry, Councillor Cario and then Dabrowski. I forgot about Councillor Dabrowski, I apologize. Okay, Councillor Dabrowski. My point's I, almost lost through this whole <laughs> I know, operating it was a while ago. Sorry um, about that. budget discussion, but just to, through, our, through the Mayor to Ms. Clark, um, probably the most difficult year to prepare a budget with less income coming in or no income coming in, in in some areas and it's hard to predict we don't have a crystal ball it's almost impossible without a top line and a comparable from last year to, to move forward on a budget but um, I believe Ms. Clark and staff have done a phenomenal job prioritizing um, different projects and putting um, needs and wants in between each other um, I'd like to see the budget go through I know Councillor Peter Angelo um, had an amendment on the motion with the operating budget I'll let Ms. Clark speak to that as well to see if, if, if we can go ahead and approve that. But uh, either way, kudos and congratulations to Ms. Clark. Um, the most difficult year to put together a budget. I'm sure all municipalities across North America and the world are, are dealing with the same thing and all businesses are as well. So uh, Ms. Clark, it, it was definitely a tough job. So congrats to you and your, your team and um, look forward to hopefully approving this motion and moving forward. And I would hate to defer this even further. We Next year is probably going to be the biggest year for, for our city, for our municipality, and for our community. Um, we have to bounce back, we have to recoup and recover, and I think we need to start working on that now and deferring this a, a month or two months or, or weeks even. Um, these are, are very crucial weeks and it's a crucial time for us to move forward as a municipality. So hoping we can close the loop on this and, and get moving forward and, and get our heads down and, and start working and, and moving forward into 2021. Thank you for that, Councillor. Councillor Carrier. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, after seeing our finance director today, down she came to our meeting, I understand the urgency <laughs> in her wanting to get this done. Um, so I, that's why we want to help her get it done. But Your Worship, uh, all joking aside, you can see there's a will around the table to spend this much money on capital. I think that staff can see that. They did a great job on the budget. We're just saying, take it out of another place, guys. Try and have, have it have the least impact on the taxpayer that we can. The suggestion of a little more borrowing, a little bit out of, more out of reserves, I don't think anybody went, oh no, we can't do that. I'm just thinking, you know, take, don't take it out of the grocery fund, take it out of the college fund <laughs> and let's get moving. So it's not, a, it's not a really bad thing, you know? So I think they'll come up with another way. If we find that for some reason, the operating budget isn't as terrible as we think it's gonna be, well then we could take it there, but I wouldn't, so down the process, they'll come up with another way to take the money. And there's a will at council to do it, we'll do it. All right, I think we've had- Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilor. So, are, I, I need to understand that. So are we, we're going to, you want to make, or is there a motion to approve this budget and then we will find out later what they pull? No. Or to defer this budget and have them come back with, with it short, absent the operating dollars and showing us what they have pulled out? Yeah, so it's going to be to approve this capital budget less the uh, $4 million that's transferred from operating to capital. That part's going to be deferred, just that part only. And we're going to have to, have to come back with other ways to fund that besides adding it to operating. So potentially borrowing that or taking from reserves. That's what the motion is. So we're going to, the motion is to approve the capital, then find that information out. Yes. The, the capital less that piece. So we're not dealing with that four million piece. We're dealing with the, the other 20 million of capital. So can't we have them come back and show us that and then vote for capital? Well, we can, but the motion on the table is that we do it like that. Okay, then I'm gonna vote against that motion, thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there any other comments of council before we call the vote? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor? Okay, hold, keep your hands up. Uh, okay, and opposed? Okay, with two opposed. So that passes, so the capital budget passes with the exception of that one piece. So thank you, Ms. Clark. Appreciate your presentation and your urgency. Yes? Are you, Mr. Mayor, um, are, are, is council going to address the two recommendations on the ordering of buses and the tanker? 
Did you want me to put that slide back up? Uh, yeah, maybe why don't you, if you don't mind. Yeah, 2022, is that right? We ordered them in 21 for 22 delivery, is that right? Yes. Both buses are. Well, the buses have the tanker. And the tanker's for 2022 as well, yes. Right? Yes. That's the two items she's talking about. I'm happy to approve those. Is that right, Ms. Clark? Those are the two, both uh, due for 2022. Yeah, I am referring to recommendation number three and four, the purchase of three buses ordering this year payment in 2022, funding in 2022, okay. and ordering one tanker now with payment and funding in 2022. Okay, so we've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, budget chair, second by Councillor Dabrowski, uh, to approve the number three, number four recommendations. Is there any discussion to that? Councillor Dabrowski? Yes. I got Councillor Dabrowski, then Councillor Ainoni. Sorry, uh, through the mayor. Um, the three buses, what a what a phenomenal way to um, service the residents in the Thundering Waters area in Chippewa um, East, or, or sorry, West as well. The community is just booming out there in Chippewa, down on Willoughby and Thundering Waters as well. The traffic um, and, and the population um, is just increasing and growing so, so much so quickly. So it's just a, a, a great development that we're executing here through uh, through the city. So nice to see. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I got Councillor Iononi. Warren Woods as well, Your Worship. Warren Woods as what? Warren, Warren Woods as well. Woods he mentioned Oldfield, Chippewa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Warren, Warren Woods was the third area. Okay, great. And Garner, yep. yeah. Yeah, the city's exploding in the south and west ends. Yeah. Councillor Iononi. Thank you. Um, maybe it's Miss Clark. Where would we get that money? Uh, it says included in 2019 DC background study, but if we're worried about cash flow next year, where would we get the money for this for 2022? For the, the funding sources, uh, we would partially be paying from development charges. So this is money we've collected that sits in a reserve fund and we would have to define a funding source in 2022. So um, it would be potentially more debt for buses. Uh, through which would again get transferred to the region, uh, or we have to look at that transfer to operating um, if it still exists by January. And um, or for transit buses, you could use provincial gas tax funding. Okay, thank you. Or debt. Okay, course. thank you. Or debt. And we don't have uh, our capital reserves are dismal, so that is not an option that staff is going to come back with you. So it, your options are going to be. Okay, if there's okay. No, is there any further, uh, Councilor Carrier? Just a quick question or just comment, Your Worship. If it looks like these buses are going to go to the region and it looks like the region is going to take over the debt, wouldn't we want to put as much debt on the buses as we could? Just saying. Through you, Mr. Mayor. That is why, why the debt was proposed already for the, the first set of buses we're paying for. And yes, that is the strategy. Thanks. Thank you for that. Do we have any other comments or questions that we want to share with everybody? No. Okay, we'll call the vote then. All those in favor? Stop sharing the screen, please. I'm sorry, what did he say? Stop sharing the screen. Yeah. We need to see how the other two are voting. Okay. Okay, so let's call the vote again. All those in favor? Hold your hands on the screen. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you for that. Thank you for the WeStream update so that we get everything on video. Okay, moving along. Uh, okay, we've got report um, 7.1, potential liability and health concerns for 5G. Uh, who is going to uh, deal with that one, Mr. Clerk? And that's just for information, is that right? Yep. Okay, there we go. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if our staff could look into these following questions and receive and file that report. Uh, would the insurance company pay if it uh, was found in favor of the plaintiff? Are there limits? How does it compare to other awards such as brain tumors? And could we get a letter from the insurance company that would say that they would respond and defend and that there's no exclusions for RF radiation harm? If we can look into those things. It, no, did we not, uh, Ms. Clark, get a letter? Um, or Mr. CAO, did we not get a letter from our insurer? I thought I saw something. 
For you, Mr. Mayor, we did receive an email back and those are the highlights uh, bulleted into the report back to you. That was the comments from the insurance company. What was the comments? Uh, you, Mr. Mayor, there, uh, I've just got to pull up the report. Okay. The comments that are in the report, in the report. don't address these specific questions. They, they sort of dance around them. Um, I was asked to find out those specifically, so if we could just have a little bit more dialogue with the insurance company. Okay. With so, those specific ones. Okay, so Ms. Clark, did you, okay, so I'm sorry, could you say them one more time? Sure. Um, so this is what we're asking, I guess, Cowan to uh, respond back to. This is the rec uh, the motion. Would the, insur would the insurance company pay if it was, if they found in favor for the plaintiff? Are there limits? How does it compare to other awards such as brain tumors? And could we get a letter that would specifically say from them would they would respond and defend and don't have exclusion for RF radiation harm? Okay, so um, are there any questions of staff to, to those questions? Would you like that in a motion? Yeah, like we'll do it like that. I just want to first see if there's any questions. Okay. Uh, so then we'll, uh, is there any, do you have a seconder for that? Is that a motion? Yes, I put yeah. the motion forward. Okay, motion. We have a seconder, uh, Councillor Cario. Okay. Uh, do we have uh, any questions or discussion to the motion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Okay, thank you for that. Moving on to item 7.2, uh, Clifton Hill sidewalk widening. Uh, Mr. Nickel, did you want to speak to this report? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm able to speak to it. Um, I would draw Council's attention to the recommendations, um, specifically that um, we are looking at uh, partnering with the Clifton Hill BIA and HOCO Limited for their funding contribution to widening of sidewalks in the Clifton Hill area uh, at 100% contribution. Uh, and that council would be looking at adopting um, a proposed plan for that work and a proposed plan um, in partnership with the Parks Commission as well for the enhancement of the um, Garden Plaza concept that's included in council's package. Um, the other part to draw your attention to is um, the wiping works of the sidewalks, which would allow a lot more social distancing, would effectively eliminate some of the parking or all of the parking for that matter on street um, within the city's right of way, there would be a loss of revenue for that proposal. Um, parking on that hill is uh, challenging from an operational point of view and potentially a safety point of view uh, and is uh, part of our longer term master plan in the tourist area um, to, uh, to potentially look at removing that at a later date. Uh, so this proposal would be um, expediting that process, but obviously there's a financial um, negative financial impact to the city by doing so. Um, right now, it's difficult on all accounts for us to estimate where our parking revenues are going to be. And um, we have a few uh, uh, positive uh, things to look forward to in our parking uh, revenues, such as the opening of the new 5,000 seat theater. Um, but uh, at the, 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 this very moment, the um, proposal to move forward would have that negative impact, which would be immediately um, required to be uh, compensated for in that 2021 uh, parking budget that you'll be reviewing uh, at a later date. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, that's uh, all the comments, but I have, uh, I'd certainly be willing to take questions. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Thompson, Cario, Dabrowski. Um, I think this is a, a great uh, opportunity for the city. Uh, we always needed wider sidewalks on Clifton Hill and the parking is always a problem there with uh, the traffic and everything else. We got two great partners, the BIA for Clifton Hill who are taking the responsibility and uh, with the Parks Commission. I think it's, uh, we, we're talking about 200,000 in parking we're going to make that up with the new um, theater and everything else that's going to happen. I would be happy to mo make the motion for approval for the sidewalk Clifton Hill. 
Okay, uh, motion uh, to approve the uh, five recommendations by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange. I've got Councillor uh, Cario and then Dabrowski to speak, and then uh, Lococo. I was just going to make the motion, Your Worship. Oh, okay. I think it's a great project as oh, well. Okay. All right, good. thank you for that. Councillor DeBrosky. Yeah, Sam, you can't put a, a price on safety and anybody that's been up or down Clifton Hill pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. The parking there is unsafe. There's people weaving in and out of traffic. I love to see the street closed one day as well. I'm mm -hmm. a full advocate of street closures, but I think this is a great step in the right direction, and the fact that it will be completed by spring is phenomenal. So either way, I'll support the motion. Thank you for that. Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I love this project. I think safety is should be at the top of our list. I was speaking to Mr. Nickel, and um, Mr. Nickel, through the mayor, could you tell us what happened at the November 10th meeting with the Niagara Parks when we were speaking? You were saying that they were going to have a meeting and might be able to put some more money into the, the design of the, the park there. Can you let us know what the meeting came out of it, please? Mr. Nickel? That's true, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't have the information coming from the Parks Commission. Um, I, my information is coming from um, our conversations with uh, the BIA who put this pr proposal forward. Um, I think it's important that it, if it's part of council's decision making to, uh, to see this as a potential improvement um, funded by others other than, than city and city taxpayers, um, it would be a great opportunity to leverage that on an ongoing basis so we can see even greater improvements at that location. Um, but unfortunately, Councillor, I, uh, the only thing I do know is that the Parks Commission has uh, approved the proposal from BIA and HOCO uh, for infrastructure works to remove walls and widen into their property at the base of Clifton Hill, but I don't have any further information on the, the Parkette Park. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering if we could put it on a list to follow up and see what we can do at a future date with them. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I should point out that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Strange? No, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, you, uh, I was going to say the only other thing is that in the report you'll notice there's also a part of the presentation uh, that talks about Oaks Garden concept and there's a water feature um, in there and the, the Clifton Hill BIA has committed uh, amount of money to the Parks Commission to build a water feature and a lot of us will remember the uh, waltzing water uh, at one time, it was in a couple of different locations, but largely popular and yeah, a lot of neat, a lot of places have places like that. So they, they're looking at that as phase two, um, but, uh, but regardless, it's nice because it's the Clifton Hill BIA paying the costs to make the place safer, to make it uh, better, and also to enhance it with the water feature. So that was uh, great. And I can tell you that I know Councillor Kerry and I are both on the parks and they're uh, pretty supportive of the idea. Uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think it's a, it's a great idea, and I, obviously it's it's the, the best time is right now to do all the, these projects. It's up to, uh, for sure, Clifton Hill right now when uh, there's not a, as much traffic down there, but uh, safety has been uh, an issue for a few years. And when everything gets back to normal and we have our big concerts once again down there and our festival of lights and pack like crazy, it's really going to open up a lot of space, and uh, kudos to the BIA and, and the partners there, and especially Harry Oaks, who's always helping and beautifying uh, Clifton Hill. And you're, that's a good point, Councillor Strange. That's the timing, because it's a perfect time. It's not busy. Just like uh, the region paved uh, part of the Niagara Veterans Memorial Highway right down onto Falls Avenue and uh, uh, right up to, to Clifton Hill. And they did. it was perfect timing. It wasn't busy. So this is the time to get stuff like that doing because I really believe next year is going to be a stark contrast to this year with, uh, with the um, vaccines coming out. I, I already see the optimism in people that I'm speaking with that I really think next year is going to come back quicker than people have been predicting. Um, so was there a um, motion? Yeah. So we, did we, call, so we got the motion, uh, moved already, seconded by Councillor Strange. Is there any other discussion to the motion? He's seeing none. All those in favor? Okay, that is approved and that's unanimous. Thank you to everyone for that. Um, item 7.3, there's a potential, uh, potential fortification bylaw. There's a recommendation to receive. Motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Dabrowski that we receive and file. Uh, Councillor uh, Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was speaking to Mr. Herlovich about um, if we had any data from Hamilton, Burlington, Mississauga, London, uh, what was their experiences, how many 
complaints did they have, how was enforcement, just to receive a little bit more data, and he said he was going to ask, but I guess we didn't get it back yet. Uh, yeah, I guess, is Mr. Hurlovich, uh, uh, we did not get it back? Yeah, I don't have that information. I can just say what's reiterated in the report, and that is there were five complaints over three years in Niagara Falls. But I will try and get that information for the councillor. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have any other um, comments? No? Did we call? I didn't call the vote yet, did I? No. All those in favor? Okay. And that is unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 7.4. Now, item 7.4, approval of draft plan of condominium for Montrose Road, 6591 Montrose Road. Now, it is not a public meeting. Um, uh, Mr. Hilovich can do a presentation, but if council wants to pass the recommendations, that can be done without the presentation. Okay. Motion by Councillor uh, Cario, seconded by Councillor Strange, that we uh, approve the, let me just get it up here, sorry, that we approve the four recommendations in the report. Is there any discussions to the motion? Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In the report, it says that uh, servicing permit used and building permit applications have been reviewed and waiting for payment. Why are we waiting for payment, I was wondering. And the other question I had was, um, it talks that we have a line of credit and the city's holding that. I was wondering how much it was. Okay, Mr. Hurlovich, are you able to answer those questions? I can't tell you the line of credit. I thought it was in around $100,000 range, but I can get that for the councillor. And um, what was the first question again? I've already forgotten. It says we're waiting for payment regarding the permits and the building permits, servicing yeah, well, and building. Yeah, so when people come in to pick up their permits, they drop off the payments. They haven't come in for their building permits, so they haven't made the payments. So we collect it when we issue the building permits. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I have a question. Yes, Councillor Iannone. Is anybody else on Zoom having a problem with hearing or sound coming in and out? I, I'm my my internet's coming in and out. I'm just hearing every other word. So I just wondered if it was just mine. Everybody's shaking their heads. No. Are you on an iPad or desktop? Okay. I'm on my iPad. So you may want to check with um, your. Action. All right. Up to item 7.5. Revised. I'll call the vote. But, oh, did I not call the vote? No. Well, thank you for the reminder. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Item 7.5. Revise. And, and I should note, it was unanimous with the exception of Councillor Inoni, who's re logging out and in again, or turning your computer off and on. 7.5, staff came back with a revised municipal alcohol risk management policy. We're looking for uh, approval. Moved by Councillor uh, Thompson, seconded by Councillor um, Peter Angelo. Uh, Councillor Cario? No. Oh, okay, so we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. And thank you to staff for coming back with that. That was what we're looking for. Uh, Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to approve 7.6 Welland Street Speed Control. Two recommendations. Second by Councillor Cario. Uh, did we have? Oh, I see a hand in the air. Yes, Councillor. Uh, uh, Director of Finance Tiffany Clerk. 
Uh, three, Mr. Mayor, you put this on hold with suspending the operating transfer capital. Oh, the Welland Street one? All of the speed humps, I believe, had transferred the capital money. So all the speed humps is part of that. So so then what should we... What should, come back with options, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so we're still going to approve them subject to your options. Is that good? Okay, great. So uh, motion, I'm sorry, remind me. Motion by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Kirio. 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 Okay, if there's no more hands in the air, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. The motion by Councillor Thompson to remove the consent agenda, seconded by Councillor Strange. Does anything need to be lifted before we call that vote? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Um, communications and comments of the city clerk. So, yes, Councillor Lacoco. 9.1, I have a conflict, and since we're discussing it, I'm to leave the room. Okay. Okay, Councillor Lacoco, I declare conflict on 9.1. There are two people that want to speak at time. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have the um, the downtown BIA's budget, and we have letters from the downtown BIA, BIA as well. Uh, the recommendation is for council's consideration and approval. Before we uh, do, we do have a couple of speakers who've requested to speak to the. Oh, and Wayne Campbell. All right. Uh, yes, Councillor Campbell. I, I would we move that we allow them to uh, speak. Okay. Motion by, uh, and the two are Amanda McDonald and Steve Itchelson. Is that right, Mr. Clerk? I think that's close. Okay, all right. So motion by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Strange, that the two speakers be allowed to speak. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Uh, so we'll ask uh, first uh, Amanda McDonald, Executive Director of the Downtown BIA. Uh, can you hear us, Amanda? I can, Mr. Mayor. Is there any ability to share my screen? I, uh, I normally, but if you want, I can I'm, I'm sorry. So what? Uh, she wants to screen. Like you have something to show us? You mean? I would love to uh, just do a quick overview of our budget, um, and then answer any questions that council may have. Okay, we have the budget in front of us, by the way. Oh, perfect. This one's a little bit of uh, an overview of the projects that we'll be undertaking within the budget itself. Okay, well then, you know what, we'll do that. We'll, um, uh, we'll our uh, IT people are gonna allow you. Yeah, yeah, before? Okay, yeah, and just while you're kind of preparing the screen, Councillor uh, Cario. <clears throat> Your Worship, as I, as I was reading this and reading the letters and the petition, and I, uh, I thought that the issue is, I don't think is the budget. The issue mm -hmm. is the procedure. And we don't have a problem, and we've never really gotten involved in uh, determining what uh, a BIA should or shouldn't spend. It's their money, not our money. We are just collecting it for them. Uh, and I think our, it's our job to make sure they do things properly, that all of the procedures are followed properly, so that things are done the way they're supposed to be done, and that uh, you know we, we take that into consideration. So I think if the speakers can hear what I'm saying, we don't, have, I don't, I don't personally have a problem with the money, it's just, the question would be in regard to the procedure, and that's what the complaints that I have uh, heard or whatever are, are centered around. Not, not the, well, some of them are complaining that it's too much money, but the city usually doesn't get involved in setting the budgets or how much the BIAs assess themselves. So that would be something we, we could listen to, but that's not what we normally do. Okay, and you're right. You're right. For other BIAs, typically we approve it or we don't approve it, but we always approve it. It's their money. Okay. Having said that, and I know, Amanda, you heard that, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think this will probably be more for uh, interest for the council to see what you're up to. So uh, we see the screen, and the floor is yours. Much appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. So uh, this year we did a, an extensive budgeting process and hopefully this answers the councillor's other question about the process because this really will be um, walking you through how we got there and sharing with you some of the incredibly exciting things that we're going to be doing in 2021. 
um, and things that maybe uh, our council liaisons are aware of, but maybe the general public is not. So we undertook the budgeting process in the summer. Um, of course, we are a local board. I just want to remind everybody who's watching from the public. Sometimes people are not aware of that. Um, we are a collective body of the businesses. We have six mandates. Uh, so when you're thinking of our process and when I'm going over our budget, and I'll, I will make this quick, I know your time is valuable. Uh, we do have six mandates that we adhere to. So beautification, revitalization and maintenance, uh, marketing promotion, special events, business recruitment, and communication amongst our membership. With their significant return on investments, I would advise anybody to go and see the ROIs of BIAs on the Ontario Business Improvement Area Association, but I won't uh, harp on this point too much because I think we all here know uh, the value of what a BIA can bring to the table. And I think uh, before we start off, I want to really emphasize this part, uh, this point is that the partnership between the municipalities and local boards is one of the most fundamental foundations for a successful BIA. Um, and we thank you for that collaboration and for our council liaisons throughout the years, um, and especially our current ones. So when we looked at our budgeting, we really wanted to align with the municipality um, and what do we offer. So aligning those goals so that we can um, not only benefit our collective membership, but also the community. So looking at municipalities and the well-being of individuals and, and the environment and the community. And then for us, it's business promotion, economic opportunities, improving civic gathering spaces and really attracting residents and tourists and employers. So in our budgeting process, it's pretty comprehensive. We started with a survey of our membership and then also the uh, local residents. We wanted to gather three different things, um, determine how the downtown Niagara Falls is doing, how the ideas can help position the future. And then we wanted to use this to align our members' expectations with our efforts. And we actually sent these results back to our five different committees. We have 30 businesses across these committees. Um, and then that went to our finance and audit. Our finance and audit, audit amalgamated these. And then it went to our board of management. And then the board of management approved it in September. And the board of management then sent it to the AGM for review. So we really looked at the business owner perspective and also the residential. And we looked at what was happening in 2019. So beautification, we were rated incredibly low in. Um, both surveys suggested that the BI should focus on seasonal decor, winter, and lights. Um, hanging baskets were rated very highly for us on both surveys, uh, but most mentioned that they wanted eye level beautification, um, and that was needed in our downtown. So what we did, we wanted to act fast. We didn't want to wait until 2021. So during the pandemic, we were able to achieve purchase new lights for our promenade section, which I invite you all to come and see. We added several new planters to downtown. We created downtown murals along construction fences so that you're no longer seeing the construction happening behind. Uh, we're decorating every tree in downtown that has an outlet. So I'm, I'm hoping you can see that. We added these beautiful string lights on the promenade. But what do we have planned for the future? We are looking to increase our light displays in downtown. We're increasing our flower capacity. We are on a mission to create new wall murals for new artists, um, for people to come see. We're working with uh, committees of councils and the Legion to actually create a Veteran Day banner program. Uh, we're assessing our gateway signage to match our new branding, which by the way, coming up in another sli slide, we're super excited for. And our biggest project is our projection mapping in downtown. So we're going after a million dollars uh, through hopefully the federal, uh, federal government and the province of Ontario through stacked funding. And we're also looking at new banners in downtown and yearly promenade lights. So this is the projection, uh, pro uh, the projection mapping program that I was talking about. We're working with our local architecture, uh, architectural firm in downtown. We submitted for the uh, Bring Back Main Street Challenge, and we were selected uh, from the province of, um, from all of the submissions in the top 10. Uh, so it was the most feasible uh, idea to actually revitalize the downtown. And this is what we're actually hoping to do in 2021. So these are the plan locations. And you're probably asking, what is projection mapping? Well, it's using, and I'm sure most of you know from the Winter Festival of Lights, it's using projections onto old buildings, telling stories, narrative, audiovisual, and whatnot. And we've already applied to about $90,000 in additional funding through different programs. So this is what hopefully near the end of or mid 2021, we can hopefully achieve. 
We are also looking at um, a significant program. So obviously revitalization, revitalization of maintenance in 2019 was an issue for us. Security in downtown, although we have incredibly low crime rates, um, we do need security cameras. It is a number one priority item amongst our membership. And so that is a significant cost in the increase in the budget. And you'll see that line item in there so that we can implement that um, in Q1 of 2021. Marketing and promotion. So our members rated our website and branding uh, poorly, uh, but saw a great start to our social media. We actually received a $20,000 grant for marketing and promotions through the Digital Main Street grant program. Uh, we hired two people and we have those two people um, have actually been going around to our businesses and helping them apply for $2,500 grants uh, in the last three months. Um, and to which we've had, I believe, three to five businesses actually succeed in receiving those. And as you can see, it's hidden under here, but we do have our new branding, which is coming soon. Um, it's top secret, so we're looking to launch it. I know Councillors Dabrowski and Campbell have seen it, and they're very excited for it. So successes in 2020, just to, uh, to remind you, we did have the switch from Queen Street to downtown Niagara Falls. We are that rebranding. Re uh, we are having publications of press releases and SEO um, increase across uh, web content. We are looking at uh, multiple platforms, LinkedIn, TikTok, we grew our Instagram, advertisements, um, implementation of monthly newsletters. Um, we are putting out those newsletters uh, on the first of every month. So our members are seeing all of the updates along with the meetings, um, all of the information, the agendas and whatnot. We also feel good Friday social media posts. So very small things for council, but very big things for us. And so what are we looking to do in 2021? So we're looking for a communication and social media strategy. We're also looking to increase our SEO optimization. So when you search down or when you search Niagara Falls, uh, downtown is on the first or hopefully second page. We also want to increase our marketing in the tourism sector because we do predict, just like council, that we will have a bounce back with the vaccine. So we are preparing for that now. We're also growing our newsletter subscriptions um, from our 2020 numbers and our Christmas season shopping passport for 2021. So look out for that. We're also looking at downtown gift card program and launching for the holiday season for 2021, along with providing services for our businesses from our staff where we can actually create the commercials in house for them so that we can have organic content continually going out. And we are looking at an online marketplace with which Councillor Campbell has been helping with as well. And for Council this evening, we want to just give you a very quick sneak peek of what our website is looking like. Um, of course, top secret over our logo there, but um, it is almost ready to launch and we're super excited for the public to see it. Of course, our special events in 2019 were rated lowly or low um, or poorly, but we have um, jumped into action. The number one event that does bring people back, and we understand that that's hard during COVID, is concerts. Um, but we believe that we did a significant amount during the pandemic um, safely, and we had no incidents, and we had full contract tracing, uh, masks, and all uh, protocols in place. And just to recap, our successes in 2020. We, had, we currently have our Christmas market, which we invite you out to. We had our nightmare on Queen Street, a drag show, weekly vendor markets, um, weekly movie nights in the summer. We had yoga on the promenade, summer concerts uh, weekly. And then we also had our cruising on the queue. We also assist with, and I remind council uh, that we do in a very minor way, we understand that the city puts on these events, but we do help with the Santa Claus parade. Um, the Night of Art, and of course, hopefully in 2021, we can bring back Canada Day. Again, again, we're looking to do a, a month-long fall festival, food truck Fridays, supper markets, concerts in the park, and a Go Green initiative. But of course, COVID pending, we do have other plans just in case. And then business recruitment, this is the one area that we have definitely uh, not uh, put our best foot forward on. Uh, we've been mostly event focused in the past. We are looking at promoting downtown as a place to shop because that did receive a low grade. So what do we plan to do about this particular mandate is a win this space competition. This is a best practice across uh, cities in Ontario. We are planning to work with your ECDEV office and the small business enterprise to actually deliver this along with Spark. We are looking at a downtown investment package and creating that for when we do go and court investors into buying property, which we are actively doing. 
We are looking to do social media, business fundamentals, and other webinars and seminars. And of course, we're looking to add to downtown brochures, and we also will have a real estate section on our website for property owners. And then communication. And these are actually the two employees that we received the grant for. So uh, if you see them on the street, make sure that you say hi to them. Our communication was actually rated fairly okay compared to our other categories in 2019. So there is board awareness. Um, it was great at low, but we are looking to increase that through the monthly newsletters, the Facebook events. So if you were to go on to the downtown Niagara Falls Facebook, every committee meeting with details on how to join along with the actual board meetings is on the social media pages along with our website. And uh, we do submit that to the city as well. I also took the initiative to mail out uh, notices of the AGM this year in August, and I hand delivered it to every business owner on the street that was open. Um, and then we also make sure that all of the uh, information for the upcoming committees and, and board meetings for the year goes out in early Q1. So we really wanted to look back at where we've been. There were a couple quotes uh, from 2019 uh, from a previous uh, board chair. Uh, during the recession, and I think it holds uh, true today that downtown won't revitalize itself. We are doing what we uh, what typical BIAs do. If we are going to do anything that's more aggressive than a typical BIAs do, then the more power to us. And just to put that into perspective for you, we do have a 2021 break uh, budget breakdown based on mandates for you, just so that you can really visualize where each of these categories is going into. So our human resources is about 24.8% of our budget. Our administration is about 10.2. Our revitalization and maintenance is 6.5. Our special events is 17.4. And our marketing and promotion is 8.4, or 8.4, sorry, and special events 17.4. Um, beautification, economic and, uh, development and business recruitment is by far our largest budget item because I think it's where we need the most um, effort and assistance at 32.8%. And so again, looking back at uh, and just changing out one word, instead of saying recession and looking at the pandemic, the pandemic is not a time to go to sleep. It's a time to go harder. Everybody believes in what we're doing and they want to be successful, but not everybody wants to chip in. That was from a newspaper article. So while we understand the objections from some members, we are in agreement with the Ontario Business Improvement Association, where they are advocating that BIAs think about uh, recouping and reinvesting after um, and being prepared for when the vaccine comes out in 2021. And that's what we're doing. So we're very excited for our plans. And if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. Do we have any questions? Yes, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mer through you, Mr. Merrick. Uh, yeah, thank you, Amanda, uh, for that presentation. Um, I just, uh, I know last weekend we had the big uh, Santa Claus parade virtual and it was little bit of mixed feelings by everybody, but as uh, uh, our mayor was saying, we had every car from all over the region coming down those roads. So hopefully we can do something like that again or something uh, before Christmas for some of those uh, uh, unhappy families didn't get a chance to see Santa. But, you know, you guys pivoted off that and you had the, uh, the Christmas market. And that's all I've heard about the last... Uh, few days of how great it was to go down there and you I think I believe you're having it maybe you can tell everyone what you're having it the next few weeks as well um, and the other thing I was interested in, in your fed dev uh, application um, is, is that coming up and what's the timeline on that and, and did you say that was for a million dollars yeah good question so first off with the actual Christmas market thank you for bringing that up it is every Friday Saturday and Sunday from 5 until 10 p.m. We do actually have our local businesses participating in it. Uh, so we ha will have uh, the Little Shop of Beauty who's actually a vendor and we do have our members who are able to get one of the cabins for free. Uh, so we're super excited about that. Come and visit us. We are hoping to bring out Santa so that maybe uh, some families can uh, socially distance and, and visit as well. Uh, so stay tuned for details on that. But as for the FedDev funding, uh, we are looking for the projection mapping. So we have applied to numerous grants. Um, including the New Horizons for Seniors uh, program. So essentially what we're hoping to do is we're, uh, because we're one of the downtowns in Ontario that actually has audio um, and uh, in sync um, system across the entire catchment. Uh, so we're actually able to offer a very different experience with projection mapping. 
So what we're going to be doing is we actually have to show that we have skin in the game. So our budget, um, we have a carry for or carryover from 2020, and then we'll ha we have some funds budgeted for 2021. That will be our portion of the investment. We'll be seeking funds from the Southwestern Economic Development Fund, and then we'll be stacking that with the Fed Dev. In total, the project uh, requires about $1.1 million. And, and what's the timeline on that? Is that? Good, good question. It's a proposal based timeline. So you hear from, so say we uh, submit before Christmas, we hear in about 60 days, we do need a partner and we're currently seeking one. We think we have one secure for it. Um, so we'll know about 60 days after the proposal and then implementation could be as early as June. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for the presentation. I know, you know, downtown uh, sometimes gets ignored. Um, you know, our master plan down there is to try to obviously fix it all up and especially with the GO train coming, we want to beautify everything down there. And, and thank you to the BIA for putting this forward. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Councillor Strange. Any other comments um, or questions of Ms. McDonald? Okay, seeing none, we do have another uh, presenter. Um, I don't know if I've got the name right, Steve Itchelson? Eccleson, please, Mr. Mayor. Eccleson, okay, sorry Eccleson. about that. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to the call. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, uh, my name is Steve Eichelson. I am a Principal and Vice President of Operations for Avis & Young Real Estate Management. We are the property manager for 4342 Queen Street, uh, which has been owned by Desjardins Financial Security for the last 13 years. In that period, we have had people volunteer on the downtown BIA for six years, myself for three. And we have provided them with a home and office space for far reduced costs than market. We are also the largest funder of the BIA. Our levy contribution accounts for 33% of the BIA's budget. To give you an example, that works out to 48 cents per square foot of rent for our tenants. As is the case in anywhere in real estate, this is passed on to our tenants. While 4342 Queens tenants are national tenants or government, that will not, this levy increase will not affect us that greatly. It will affect the other tenants and landlords up and down Queen Street, probably by making their space highly unleasable at the moment. We're a member of 11 BIAs in the province of Ontario. By far, the downtown BIA has the highest per square foot operating cost of any BIA we're a member of. The one that we know that does the best of any form of marketing, promotion, and growing of its neighborhood is the Bloor Yorkville BIA in downtown Toronto. That's 11 cents a square foot. The request being put through by downtown BIA now will bring our cost to 90 cents a square foot. $130,000 a year of their budget. I know we're not the only one. There's a few other members of, that have signed the petition that bring this cost to about 60% of the budget. You should note that across the province, we are seeing BIAs lowering their operating costs for next year. And more importantly, I think where I've heard a number of you today since I've been on this call since 4 o'clock say that you'd like to hold the too much to affect businesses in Niagara Falls. This amounts to a 14, sorry, yeah, a 14 percent increase in our building's property taxes. That's before you folks have gone through your budgets, approved everything, and passed on any increase we may see this year. Uh, as a further example, we've been on the BIA for six years. I know it's a dysfunctional BIA. For example, we have not seen any of these communications. It has not been marketed to the street. It's not been brought to everybody. And that's why people are upset about the process. While I don't disagree that the BIA has done a terrible job of marketing itself and Queen Street, if they don't get their act together, no one's going to be happy with them. And for example, as to why they're not doing well, if you go through their budget and you look at just the human resources line, if you add up the line items, it comes to $112,000. They've listed it as $99,000. They're actually starting off with a shortfall of $13,000 before they, you even pass this. 
again, as most people have said, I don't think people truly are begrudging the increase. They're just looking for an open and fair and a presentation that they can all participate in. So thank you very much. And I uh, hope you send this back to the BIA to meet with its membership and work on this. Do we have any questions for, um, for Steve Eccleston? Any questions? Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes, Councillor Iannone. I have comments to, to his presentation. Um, I sat on the BIA for many, many, many years. Um, the BIA today is vastly different than the BIA was even just a year ago. When we go through our, our presentation uh, and the information council has been provided, we, we see that all the objectors are the anchor businesses on Queen Street. The lit there are, there are, there's the geographical location of businesses of buildings on Queen Street there where people come and go. I mean, we all know that one day there's one business in there, the next day there's another business in there if they can fill that spot. But the objectors we have are the, are the anchor businesses that are successful. We just got a letter from Olson and Sotil while we were sitting in this, in this um, meeting. We have Grand Central, uh, an anchor business. We have Taps, an anchor business. We have Nioma, an, an anchor business. Um, they're all saying pretty much the same thing. And while I agree that we, we should not be getting involved in dictating how they do that, I know that the BIA goes through the clerk in order to to coordinate an AGM appropriately, and I'm hard pressed to believe that the dozen and I and I went to make sure that the petition was people downtown because we've had that question on people not being applicable to to uh, sign a petition. But this petition art is people downtown, and the anchor businesses that are comp that are are giving objections and saying, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, we can't afford this, are businesses that have stayed and not disappeared. And I really think that the BIA needs to respect those anchor businesses, listen to the objections they have, and go back and reconsider this. These are the businesses that have stayed and not disappeared. And that includes um, Tony Barranca's hair salon. That includes um, the jewelry store that includes the highlight that it's it's all the way down the street the anchor businesses that have stayed there are the ones that are telling us that they do not like the process this was not done fairly and I think it's alarming to hear here this gentleman tell us that they haven't seen any of this presentation and they're on the BIA and they will have the highest hit so I'm not going to support passing this BIA budget and just ask that they bring it back where we don't have dozens of the businesses downtown telling us that a they don't approve it and nobody likes an increase but in the midst of a pandemic we're telling people we're telling residents that we can't afford an increase but the bia's is this one is staggering so i think they need to take a sober second look at what how they have done this process and get more buy-in or acceptance of the process from their members thank you Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Um, do we have any other um, speakers or questions of the speakers or for staff? Councillor Cario. Well, Your Worship, uh, it might be a good idea to ask the first speaker if she could comment on the second speaker. Okay, yeah, fair enough, good call. Uh, Ms. McDonald, did you wanna uh, comment on the uh, gentleman that spoke after you from Avis and Young? Yes, I would actually. Um, I appreciate the comments and I understand uh, the people who have signed the petition. I would like to state with some of the people who have signed the petition, I am a little bit concerned because they are, they were involved heavily in the actual budgeting process. Mr. Bronca, for example, was the one who actually motioned the increase for the cameras for 30,000 and an additional greenery for 20,000. And that increased 50,000 in total on the budget above what was in 2020. Um, I do understand. Uh, that some members, um, bigger businesses, will be bearing the brunt of this and that different BIAs across the province. I, I respect uh, the, the presentation from the member. Um, however, I would like to note that we are vastly different from those BIAs. Um, their square footage, I would love to see 
the different property values, the assessments and whatnot, we would be different. Um, in addition to, we are excited to kick off for the 2021 year. We do believe that a vaccine will be in place and we do need to start now more than ever to prepare our members for reopening. I know it's difficult uh, due to the stage that we're currently in. However, we want to be looking into when the into the 2021 year, which is when this budget is actually set for. So our members won't even be seeing this budget until March of next year. Okay, thank you for that. And did you have any questions uh, for Ms. McDonald? Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh, not for the speaker, any questions, just for staff. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I guess through you to Mr. Matson, um, who would probably be our expert in terms of process. There's been a couple of challenges in terms of process. I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind weighing in on it to help council. Mr. Madsen? Oh, yes, through, through the mayor. In terms of process, uh, administratively, I think that's where the concerns are. And in the past, I've never been involved administratively as far as promotion of the meeting or, in this case, uh, you know, setting up that meeting virtually. I think we've seen over the months even the challenges that we faced here trying to set up a meeting virtually and the number of times there were speakers not been able to get through, um, that's beyond control. Uh, the, the BIA did reach out to myself to review uh, their constitution, uh, which I did. And But as far as the, the majority of the concerns being around the budgeted amount or uh, the administrative processes and how it was handled, that's something that staff here have never been involved with and I'm not involved with, with any other BIA. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'm told that uh, Mr. Ickelson's got his hand up. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, and I've got, and then after that, I'll get to Councillor Campbell. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, sir. Mayor, uh, I would just like to echo what Councillor Iannone said. Please be aware, the people that are really complaining about this are the people that are stable on Queen Street. These are the people that are paying their rent and are surviving. And no matter how bad the pandemic is, these are the people that will survive this and they will be there at the end. It's the people that can't do this. These are the ones that are going to have to face the brunt of this. This is a fairly heavy, as much as I don't want to say it, tax increase to people who are just not at the time right now that they can put up with this. And if you put more businesses out of business, on Queen Street, it's not going to make the street look any better. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> I've only been on the uh, BIA for what, the last four months. What's that old saying? If you, do, if you continue to do things the way you've always done them, you'll always get the same results. The people on this BIA are business people. They're excited to make things happen in downtown Niagara Falls. It's going to take people like this and this budget to make things happen. And I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know that it seems like it's a large budget, but if you look at it over a month by month increase, I don't think it's, it's something that the city of Niagara Falls should even get involved in. Leave it up to the BIA membership. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor. Um, okay, so uh, Council, we've heard uh, the two presenters. We've all had comments. I don't know if there's if there's no further comment, then I guess we'll entertain a motion. Councillor Dabrowski. I'll comment and then make a motion. Um, just to Councillor Campbell's point, I agree. I was a, I've been lucky enough to have been a board member on the downtown BIA as a resident for three or four years. Seen executive directors come and go. I've seen board members come and go. I've lived on that street for the past 42 years. Not lived on it, but I, I've done karate lessons on that street. I remember grocery shopping on that street. And for the past 15 or 20 years, nothing's been done on the street that's been effective for any of the businesses. Yes, we have anchor businesses, but we need a new team. We need a new board in charge. And I think, and I, I strongly believe, the board that's in place is effective. They're, they're energetic, they're go-getters, they're, they're doers, they're not just talkers. And the executive director, Amanda, I'm not sure if she's still on the line, but the street is so lucky to have Amanda with her expertise with grant writing, social media, marketing, events, 
communication. The presentation that we saw today, I'm not sure, I've only been on city council for two years, but has the Queen Street BIA ever presented a presentation like that? No. So I agree with Councillor Campbell. Doing nothing creates nothing. Change might be difficult at first. It does get easier. And I just hope that the businesses can come together. They're not going to agree with everything that the board comes up with, including maybe this budget. However, you have to give people a chance. 2021 will be a great year. We will recover, but we have to start planning now. And that's what I think the BIA needs to do. So I'll make a motion that we do approve the budget okay. as, uh, as outlined by the BIA. Okay, motion by Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, I'll for, second that. Okay, seconded by Councillor Campbell. Do we have any discussion to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, hands up and opposed? Councillor Iononi, are you opposed? Are you opposed, Councillor? She can't hear. Turn your thing on. Come on. <laughs> no, you only turn on to talk. I can, I'm hearing every third word. What was that motion? So the motion is passing the budget, is approving the budget, approving the BIA budget. I'm opposed. Okay, thank you. So she's. I'm going to log. I'm, I'm going to log off and log back on. Okay, thank you. Okay, mo uh, so that's approved. That's approved. Okay, so we should ask uh, Councillor uh, Lacoco to come back in. I think is what we're done. Our Sergeant at Arms. <clears throat> Okay, we'll wait till she gets back here. I know, I just want to wait for her to get here. Yeah, 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 totally it does. Welcome back, Councillor. So we just concluded uh, item 9.1. So we're moving on to item 9.2, Heavy Construction Association of Regional Niagara. Uh, there was a recommendation for the information of council. Motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Strange that we receive and file. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.3, Illicit Cannabis Resolution for from Norfolk County. Uh, we've got a Resolution. What did yes, uh, Councillor Coco? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, within this resolution, uh -oh. <laughs> within this resolution, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Within this resolution, it talks about better regulations and tracking of prescription of cannabis by doctors, increased funding to municipalities to deal with complaints and bylaw issues generated by illicit grow ops. From, from all of the information and education that I've been trying to glean on this subject because it's a huge subject in our city. Um, one of the challenges is about prescription, medicinal marijuana with prescriptions. If you're taking a, an antidepressant or opioids for uh, surgery, does anybody else know that you're taking that as medication? So there, there's a privacy issue about, the, um, about if people know who has medicinal marijuana. Now the illicit part isn't by them growing it with their license. The illicit part may come, and it doesn't always come, is the number of plants exceeding their license. So the wording in this was a little deceiving. It's not all illicit. It's only illicit if somebody goes over the number of plants. Mm -hmm. And I just want to put it out there, do we really need to know who has medicinal marijuana? Um, there are some other challenges um, about the number of plants illegally, but that's different, that's not this. I just want to put that out there. So we, uh, yes, uh, okay, thank you for that. Councillor Campbell. Yes, uh, Your Worship, I checked with Health Canada. There's no difference between medical and recreational cannabis. So growing indoors or out outdoors does not make a difference to that. And there is no difference. So I, I don't know where this, uh, reference to medical marijuana is so important. Okay, well, we can just receive it if we want. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Peter Edger wanted to say something. Well, Your Worship, the only thing I was going to say is I think that this item here, 9.3, is, uh, I guess, a direct connection to 9.7. And we also um, received something from the Niagara Police Services Board. And I, I 
I, I think it's in regards to um, medical prescriptions, Your Worship, and 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 I think that's and I think that's the issue. Um, I don't think anyone has an issue with you know growing the legal limit, but there's a lot of people that have prescriptions, and and you know um, that's their uh, that's their prerogative to have those prescriptions. But I, I but I believe that 9.3 deals with 9.7. That's all. Okay. So did uh, we want to just did someone say receive? Receive and file. Your Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angel, that we receive and file. Receive and file. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 9.4, advocacy letter to Premier Ford maintaining public support for public health guidelines comes from the City of Oakville. The recommendation is for councillors council's consideration. I don't know if there is any. Um, He's uh, calling on Premier Ford for an, uh, to advocate for a targeted approach driven and backed by evidence in order to maintain public support for public health. So I'm not really sure if, uh, I know Oakville's having some challenges. They're in a different zone than us. Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson to receive and file, seconded by Councillor Strange. Uh, if there's no discussion to it, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. Item 9.5, Dominion, Niagara Holding Limited on Queen Street. Refer to Our, staff, Your Worship. Okay, so they're looking for um, staff feedback in regard to the Building Facade Improvement Grant Program. We'll refer that to staff. Uh, a motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. 9.6, City of Niagara Falls Integrity Commissioner Annual Report. I'll be in committee room. You're going to be in committee room one? Yep. Okay. Oh, right, right, okay, right. Uh, is, um, what's the will of council? Uh, Councillor Cario. I think it's a great report, Your Worship. Um, my question was going to be, um, should, should we look at a, a, is this the time to look at an update of our code of conduct? Should we be looking at a review update? Uh, are there any gray areas in our code of conduct that we should be addressing? Um, how does our code of conduct compare with other municipalities? Um, I was wondering uh, whether or not this is the time to uh, have staff look at either uh, getting some assistance and having a look at it, just so the council knows where we fit and what our, where our code of council is comparable with others. And like I said, if, if it needs to be tightened up a bit, um, maybe our code of conduct is, uh, it could be simpler so that when we do have a, a problem, when there is a breach, it might be easier for an integrity commissioner to come to a conclusion. Um, maybe that question should be asked as well. I don't know whether we engage, whether the staff would like to engage someone to work with them on this or whether they want to do it themselves. I'd like to maybe get a comment from, from someone from staff, maybe the clerk or whatever, to see what he thinks about what I'm suggesting we do. Sure, thanks for that, uh, Councilor Cario. Uh, Mr. Clerk, so suggestion from Councilor Cario that we refer this to staff for an update, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, through through yourself, Your Worship, I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, I think the process of uh, the uh, code of conduct and the hiring of an integrity commissioner has been handled in the past by our, our legal department. Uh, perhaps at a uh, staff level we can discuss uh, how that's done. You've seen just as an attachment in tonight's report, there was also a report through our CAO's office last year on the role of an integrity commissioner when uh, Ted McDermott was appointed after Janet Leeper had left. Um, I think that's a great follow-up uh, motion. Uh, it's even recommended, I think, in some uh, uh, code of conducts that a review process be part of the actual code. Uh, that's something that's lacking from our code of conduct. And I think we could certainly utilize the uh, expertise of our integrity commissioner himself to assist in that process as well where you know, we have a, a, a either a yearly or, or you know, twice during a term of council review of the code of conduct, just to make sure that it's up to date. Uh, tonight's incident is a perfect example. We received an annual report from our integrity commissioner and you know, a line in that report talks about his role with dealing with conflict of interest. Uh, our code of conduct uh, has sat on a shelf for a couple of years and should have been updated and unfortunately wasn't. And you know, it was a little bit alarming to see in there that uh, our code specifically stated that the integrity commissioner not deal with conflict of interest. And that's simply due to the fact that 
the code when it was written predated the changes to the legislation. Um, so for tonight's purposes, uh, I think it's just a housekeeping matter that we initially update the code of conduct to recognize the integrity commissioner's role. But I think in the future, uh, Councillor Curio's suggestion to have it updated and reviewed and perhaps look at other municipalities is certainly appropriate. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I compared the old code of conduct to the new code of conduct, so if we are going to be reviewing it, there's a few comments um, that I have and I don't know why there's some changes. Um, for example, on page six, it talks about the Municipal Act and the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act but then the new one only says the Municipal Act and the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. That might be a, just a change in the Act, but I was wondering about that. The other one is, um, I know we've had a, um, a gentleman um, email in about the um, ability for a, an individual only to put in a Conflict of Interest um, complaint where parts of it say a group or individual, and it was competing, um, one said you couldn't, one said you could, so I'd like to see that. Um, it says 60 days of filing in the Municipal Act. Some of the other co code of conducts in other municipalities are, and per the Municipal Act, it's 60 days of the awareness of it, not of, of when it actually happened. Uh, so I'd like to look at that. And then um, on page 13, municipal conflict of interest is removed. And then um, speaking to what Mr. Matson said about um, the integrity commissioner not being able to give conflict of interest advice, I remember our, our first integrity commissioner, she did specifically say that we could contact them. So I'd like to get that cleared up. And if we can't use the integrity commissioner for conflict of interest advice, who do we go to? Do we need to hire a lawyer? Um, because I, I know that when we've asked our solicitor for opinions on that, he has stated that he's not able to give that to us. So if the integrity commissioner is not able to give advice on conflict of interest, who can we go to? So those are some things that I'd like to review in that process. Okay, thank you for that. Good points, Councillor. Yes, uh, Mr. Clerk? Uh, just to touch on a couple of those, uh, you're right, uh, our current code doesn't allow for the integrity commissioner to talk about conflict of interest. And my, my point in the memo tonight is that's, that was an oversight. That's something that should have been changed in our code of conduct when the legislation changed. And for whatever reason, it didn't. And in fact, I don't even think our integrity commissioner knew that was in there until you know, somebody specifically went and looked at that section and saw that it was there. So I agree uh, with all of your points. And I think that's something that uh, uh, you know, the potential motion that uh, Councillor Curio speaks about what address and in, in tidying up all of those things. Um, I don't think it's anyone's intent that the integrity commissioner not give conflict of interest advice. Um, so to look elsewhere would be an issue mm -hmm. that you just pointed out. So again, this is just to try and clean that up, but I think a further review is warranted. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Curio. Well, Your Worship, prior to this, it was up to us to, to engage our own solicitor. Yep. to give us conflict of interest advice. So, I mean, that's what I did, and that's what I think others did. So they would make their best call, but if it was a gray area, you'd call your lawyer and, and, and get them to make a comment or get them to give you a ruling. But after we do this tonight, I'm saying we can do that with the integrity commissioner. Am I not right? Sure. After tonight. The other question I had was, Your Worship, um, could the integrity commissioner play more of a role in uh, the monitoring of our... Um, code of conduct or make it easier so that a council could become less involved in policing and maybe the integrity commissioner could take on some of that responsibility uh, for a, a smaller amount of money um, and maybe could keep us out of trouble sometimes. Uh, is that a possibility as well? That was my other question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Clerk, any uh, comment or thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I don't know that I can speak for the integrity commissioner, but certainly if this was all referred to staff, those are, are points that could be raised uh, for advice from the integrity commissioner or just through our legal department for advice. Um, again, part of the, of the overall review. Thank you. Councillor Iononi, did you want to speak? 
I'm, I'm sorry, and I just got back in, so I don't know what the conversation was before this, but is this just to refer to staff? That way I can go back and watch the, the tape yes. and understand the conversation before this. I apologize. My modem is coming in and out. Yep, yep, that's exactly what the motion is. So no decision, just to refer to staff? That's right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to clarify, at the beginning of the 2018 term, Janet Leeper, our integrity commissioner, specifically told us that we could go to her for conflict of interest. I was never given the option of going to get my own, I was never told I could go do that. So I just want to make that clear that that's the direction I was pointed in. Um, so I want to make that clear. And I just wanted to bring up one other thing. In recent news, um, there was an article about a Welland integrity commissioner, and they were talking about the cost of the integrity commissioner reports ranging from $2,000 to $4,000. And I know that this report um, speaks um, to it being a, a little bit high. And I'm just wondering the huge difference between two to $4,000 to $25,000. Um, not that I want to go bargain shopping, shopping for um, uh, integrity commissioner. I just wonder why the huge difference. Will, will we know that now, Mr. Clerk? Or? Uh, I, I I just wanted to clarify maybe something that the uh, Councillor Coco just stated. You may have been looking at the cost of the report from other municipalities. In this report, he's suggesting here's what was here's what the municipality spent from April of 2019 to April of 2020, and in our municipality it was spent over $25,000. That's not the cost of what it took for him to prepare the report. That's the cost of what he had done throughout that 12-month cycle. Um, so yes, it does vary from one municipality to another, um, but I just wanted to clarify that wasn't the twenty-five thousand wasn't the cost for that report. Uh, it's just mentioned within the report that's how much money has been spent over that twelve-month period. Councillor, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I think we did get a list of the costs, the past historic costs, and they were all a lot higher than two to four thousand dollars. That that was my point. So I do understand that this particular one is for one year, but. That was my question about in general. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so remind me, we have a motion. To motion? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion, Your Worship. And uh, Councillor Ioni asked if there was any action. Well, there is some action being taken because we're doing what the clerk has asked us to do to bring this up to date on something that was missed. Right. As well as refer to staff. Yes, yeah, so everything. <coughs> sorry. Uh, Everything that Councillor Curio has pointed out uh, would be referred to staff for further follow-up and further review. Uh, my recommendation that's listed on tonight's agenda was at least to take care of the housekeeping matters that would uh, recognize what should have been recognized when the legislation changed, and that's really just centered around the conflict of interest portions. So thank moved. So thank you for that clarification. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise I've got a lot to say on this issue, but I just... And again, I didn't get to see any of the preamble till I came back on. So I will get a chance to speak to this when it comes back. Absolutely, yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I've got a motion by Councillor uh, Cario, seconded by uh, Councillor Dabrowski. We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you to all. So um, Mr. Sergeant of Arms, could you bring Councillor Peter Angelo back in? It's probably eating all the uh, M&Ms. Thank you. We'll just give him a second to, to come back in. Did you save any of the M&Ms or did you eat all of them? Did you eat his dinner too? No, I, was, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. And it was good. Okay, thank you. Uh, we welcome Councillor Peter Angelo back in the room. Uh, we're down to item 9.7 Medical Cannabis Grow Operations Public Safety Concerns. So we received a letter from the Police Services Board. Um, and uh, the recommendation is for the information of Council. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Cario that we receive and file. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.8 Crime Stoppers requ requesting 
that the city of Niagara Falls proclaimed January 2021 as Crime Stoppers Month. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Um, item 9.9, .9, proposed regulation under the Ontario Heritage Act, Bill 108. Um, let me just pull it up here. Uh, so um, it comes from the town of Grimsby. Is there, but there's no recommendation on what we might do. So, and it's long, it's 14 page, okay. Motion by Councillor uh, Thompson that we receive and file. Second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Item 9.10, letter from Niagara Falls Hotel Association. We do have a conflict for Councillor Cario on this letter. Looking, yep. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo. Second by Councillor Strange that we receive and file. All those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous, thank you. Item 911, flag raising request from the Lebanese Independence Day. Okay, for Saturday the 21st, moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. Item 912, the MTO uh, sends us a letter about the property on Kitchener Street uh, by the 420, Councilor Peter Angelo. Well, thanks, Your Worship, and I appreciate this being on the agenda as I had brought it up a couple times earlier. Am I to understand the letter as the MTO is looking for the city to, I guess, make a decision whether or not we want them to start the process? Uh, hmm. I, I thought yeah. it said somewhere no, in the I letter, they, like, it hmm. defined the process. And <clears throat> I mean, I would love for them to start the process, Your Worship, because I really don't believe that there's going to be any other provincial ministry that would require this property and I don't even know whether or not it's uh, within their service needs so um, perhaps uh, I mean whether or not they are asking us whether or not we want to start the process I understand they're going to cut the weeds that's a good thing right. maybe they can fill the cracks in the parking lot but you know uh, barring that perhaps we can start the process your worship and they can uh, I guess evaluate whether or not it is uh, surplus to their needs and if it is surplus to their needs, then they can offer it to other provincial ministries. And barring that, perhaps we can have a conversation with them about how we can fit it into our future plans here in Niagara Falls. So would you like to make the motion I that we show would. an expression of interest? I absolutely would, Your Worship. And, and I'd like the motion to, I guess, say in part that we would prefer that they start the process um, of seeing whether or not the, uh, the land in question is surplus to their needs. And then obviously there will be a few in line ahead of us, but if they That's choose correct. not to execute, then we'll be next in. That's correct. There will be provincial ministries, Your Worship, but I can't imagine that they would require the property. Exactly. So, okay, yeah, I'd be happy to make that motion. So we have a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson, that we communicate to the Ministry of Transportation our interest in the property at 5445 Kitchener Street and request that they begin the process of declaring it surplus. Mm -hmm. Mo uh, so we've got the motion, we've got the seconder, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Uh, item 9.13, correspondence from Angela Peebles, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On here it talks about if we um, would approve Ms. Peebles to speak. I'd like to put a motion forward to allow her to speak, please. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Iannone. Uh, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. All right. So then, uh, Ms. Peebles, are you there? Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Hi. Okay. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, the reason I'm speaking tonight is I'm asking Council to consider a methadone licensing bylaw similar to what Mississauga and London, Ontario have. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to read the email that I sent and uh, some of the information I sent an email later today. I guess one of my links didn't work and I apologize for that. Um, my goal uh, with uh, asking for this bylaw I have three goals. One would be to improve the actual level of service that is being offered to people who use drugs in terms of 
medically assisted treatment and accessing um, methadone or suboxone or sublocade, which is something that is, is really new on the market. Number two, it would be to um, make access to medically assisted treatment easy and dignified. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the process of how uh, methadone works and um, how access to it is difficult, which actually um, makes it hard to maintain the um, treatment. And then number three, uh, with this bylaw, I would hope to actually uh, be able to generate an amount of revenue that could be put back into services for people who use drugs. And um, I talked to Talia Storm today, who's the manager of Streetworks, and well, she said that um, they're they are elated when they get a thousand dollars. I asked her. Um, how, like it, what sort of a difference say twenty thousand dollars would make and she said that would be a huge difference and would really augment their ability to do street outreach and include peer workers here in niagara falls so um i did have a look at the um, business license costs and i see that in niagara falls depending on what kind of business there is that it ranges from thirty dollars to six hundred and fifty dollars um, in my mind, I would think about $1,000 is what I would be looking at. And um, one of the other problems is that there isn't actually a directory of methadone pharmacies or clinics in Niagara Falls. So it's really hard to know right now uh, how many they there are actually operating. But just from my personal um, anecdotal experience, I would guess that there are probably at least 20 in Niagara Falls. So that's where we could come up with that $20,000. Um, they are not required uh, because uh, methadone pharmacies fall under uh, the region and province. They're not required to, to purchase a business license um, or follow any regulations like stipulated by the city. So, um, but um, it is my understanding that um, a lower tier municipality may pass bylaws um, with respect to this, uh, such as what Mississauga and um, London, Ontario have done. So basically how it works, um, and the way I know this is because on December 24th, which is Christmas Eve on 2018, one of the fellows who was using the uh, out of the cold shelter came to me and told me that he was ready to quit heroin. And um, I'd seen Sid and Nancy, I knew about methadone, how hard could it be? So I decided that I was going to take this on and that's when I realized how hard it actually is. And the first thing that I experienced right off the bat because it was Christmas was the hours of operation of the methadone uh, pharmacies were very erratic and hard to actually get to on time. Um, the other thing that I learned really quickly about methadone and medically assisted treatment is that it is, um, it's a taper system. So you taper up um, so if you were a regular user of heroin or actually fentanyl, which is mostly on the streets now, which is much stronger than heroin, you would probably require between 95 and 120 milligrams of methadone to actually, um, take away the sickness and to counteract that. But when you start off on methadone, you really are only started off on 25 to 30 milligrams. So there is a period of time where the person who is trying to quit heroin is given methadone, but there's not enough methadone to counteract the amount of drugs that they're used to taking. So they are using both. And what I experienced in the methadone pharmacies is that there is really no um, outreach or assistance or counseling in terms of helping somebody to, to get off of the drugs. Um, Basically how it works is you walk in and you do a urine test. And um, if you have opioids in your system, then you are allowed to see a doctor, which is actually um, a Skype call with somebody in a different city who's just sitting behind a computer. There are no blood tests. They don't weigh you. They don't take your temperature. They don't ask you about your mental health. They just determine if you have opioids in your urine and then they prescribe you your first dose of methadone. So you have to stay at that level for five days and then you um, every day you have to go in and get your methadone and drink it in front of the pharmacist. And you stay at that level for five days and then you go back, you do your urine test, you go see your Skype doctor again 
and he determines that there's opioids still in your system. So you say my, the methadone is not strong enough. So I need more. So they up your dose. And this goes on for quite a few weeks. And, and as you can imagine, it takes a long time to get up to that maintenance dose. And um, I can also tell you that from my, my personal experience, now I have not been in every methadone pharmacy in Niagara Falls. I'm just telling you what I, and, and I'm not cutting them down in any way. I'm just telling you the flaws that I saw myself personally in the system. I didn't see any um, Cassin brochures or any mental health brochures. I didn't see any um, real uh, action besides just giving the methadone, which is replacing the heroin. Now, certainly uh, methadone is definitely harm reduction because it's it comes from a pharmacy. But without the actual counseling and the outreach and the mental health services, you're just replacing a street drug with a, a prescription drug. And um, so uh, what I'm hoping for in terms of having a methadone uh, pharmacy bylaw would be that, um, well, number one, we could uh, get a directory of how many methadone pharmacies there actually are in town and um, what their hours of operation are. And with some uh, um, idea of making sure that every holiday is covered because you do become dependent on the methadone. And what I saw firsthand was that um, on Christmas day or New Year's day when your methadone pharmacy was closed, so you might have to go to a different one or the hours were super reduced. Um, oftentimes it's easier just to go back to the streets and get your drugs there. And so relapse haps and happens quite often on those holidays when the pharmacies are closed. So I think with, um, with a bylaw, we would be able to determine how many pharmacies they are, what their operating hours and what their operating hours are. Um, and then again, um, taking the money from the fee and putting that back into services that that for people who use drugs um, and yeah like just to to overall improve the level of service for people who are using that system right now because um, as Councillor Campbell mentioned um, and and Councillor Iannone mentioned uh, right now especially with COVID the situation for people who use drugs and people who um, are suffering with mental health um, and people who are living on the streets has not gotten better. Ms. Peebles, can we, we're gonna have to wrap it up. So okay. it's been eight minutes now. Yeah, if you could, please. So yeah, I hope you can pass my motion. Um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Councillor. I have a question. It, are we able to um, redirect a licensing fee to an agency like that? Um, I don't know who uh, what staff uh, would want to answer that question. Uh, just one at a time, please. It's hard to track all the hands. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start picking you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure. I, I really think this is something you just, you know, refer to staff and we'll come back with, uh, you know, what the legal ramifications are and what a draft bylaw might look like. Okay. Thank okay. you for that, Mr. Todd. Um, can I just say... Uh, piggybacking this on Councillor Campbell's um, state of emergency, these are people who are lost. These are people who who sit somewhere in the middle and are trying to get better, but try and get lost in the system and do not have um, street works there when they need them or the ability to access street works because they're so spread thin. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we direct this to staff to bring back a report. I didn't know if we, I didn't know if that was like bonusing or we could redirect a fee. And I think that's important to look at, but I think this piggybacks on, on Councillor Campbell and I saying this is important and we need to put our money where our mouth is and find any out of the way box to address the population that is lost, disenfranchised and, and needs desperate help. So I'd make that motion that we asked staff to bring back a report to see if we can do this and partner with street works. I'll second that. Okay, motion by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Pietrangelo. Thank you. That we refer to staff. Okay, for that, yes, Councillor Pietrangelo, you want to speak? Yeah, Your Worship, I just wanted to speak to it. I think the motion or a bylaw such as this is easily supportable. 
My only question, I guess, when staff uh, evaluate it is, is it in the right location in the sense that it's with the city of Niagara Falls? Um, the two bylaws that were given to us on our agenda, both Mississauga and London, are single-tier municipalities. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether or not staff are going to have to reach out to the region um, to bring them in to the conversation. Perhaps the bylaw can be uh, a regional bylaw as opposed to a city of Niagara Falls bylaw. Either way, I think it's easily supportable, Your Worship. I'm happy to second the motion. Okay. Mr. Mayor, yes, can I speak? Can yes. I speak? And, and that's where I worry, where we don't have control of it and we are dependent on the region to help us take care of our problem within Niagara Falls. This is where this group of people gets lost. So maybe they can bring us back um, both points of view, whether it can be at the re whether it's through the region or through us. But in in all the work that we do, and you're going to have another group come up afterwards and 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 speak about helping the homeless in a hospital situation. Um, this is where the this is where the they disappear into the pit of not being able to get help is when they fall between the municipality and the region. So I'm hoping we can do it and we don't hand it over to the region. And I know that the social services is their ballywick, but I think that that's how Niagara Falls loses the help it needs here. <coughs> okay, thank you for that. Is there anyone else who wants to speak to this? Okay, seeing none, then let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Um, item 9.14, Niagara Helps. Niagara Homeless Emergency Liaison and Peer Support Group. Um, there's a recommendation for the information of council. Um, uh, what's the uh, will of council? Council Coco? Councilor Uh Councilor Ainoni? I would make a motion they'd be allowed to speak. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got- Are, are they not on waiting? I thought that's what- Yep, yeah, Mr. Clerk. So I think, I believe we do have uh, Scott Cronkite uh, available to speak to this matter. Scott is a support worker um, that could speak about the Niagara Helps, Niagara Homeless Emergency Liaison Peer Support Program. Okay, so we have a motion. All those in favor of speaking? Uh, okay, uh, can we try that one more time, folks? Just to hand, okay, okay, we've got enough. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cronk White, do we have that right? Cronk right? Cronk right. Uh, concrete. Concrete. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, sir. You, you, you have five minutes if you'd like to address council on this issue. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Your Worship and councillors. And um, over the course of this evening and, and watching you work, um, I have tried to, to my presentation has, has changed quite a few times. One, and how apropos it is, is that what I'm going to speak about is exactly what uh, Councillor Campbell brought up in the importance of that particular motion and what Councillor Iannone has spoke about. Um, Councillor Iannone and I go back quite a few years and, and I knew her sister very well and I know her very well and her family and I just like to say that the work that you're doing here is vitally important to people like me um, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, again, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about Niagara Helps program. Um, that benefits the homeless here in uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, I used to be homeless. I used to be addicted to opiates. Um, I am the, uh, I went into the hospital and came out of the hospital addicted to morphine um, and kept using the morphine as help uh, with the surviving of childhood sexual assault. Um, all of these, uh, and that is what's led to my downward spiral in life at starting at the age of 40. Uh, it wasn't until I lost everything in my life that I was able to find my way back. Um, a lot of what you've said tonight is absolutely hitting the nail on the head as far as what it's like to be in this community and how easy it is for people like myself and others to fall through the cracks. Um, it took many, many people and families and local agencies to help me recover. Uh, this is the reason why I became a peer support navigator in the ED. Uh, beginning as a P being a PSN gives me a wonderful opportunity to give back uh, for those who actually saved my life. Um, I cannot stress that enough. Um, the, the lived experiences I got from being homeless and suffering from addiction 
gives me a unique way of helping uh, with those who have uh, found themselves in the same similar situation that I ended up with. Niagara Helps gives me the opportunity to use these skills every day working in the emergency department here at the Greater General, uh, Niagara General. Um, on any given day, the ER uh, is a really challenging place to work. Even worse, it can be a very scary place to have to visit. Add on top of that stigma and a lack of understanding to the experience, and it can seem like the most impossible place to try and navigate. Uh, my job as a PSN is to help those um, navigate the healthcare system. Coming in homeless, unfortunately, and there's a lot of caregiver fatigue and different reasons why, um, but people who are, are longtime drug users um, and those who suffer from a great deal of mental health uh, problems tend to have a real tough time navigating any of our um, hospital situations, our healthcare situations, um, and it becomes very confrontational from the very beginning. Uh, part of my job is to educate first um, my homeless coming in that how the ER works and how they are there as a person. It is not a personal endeavor. It is there. There isn't a chip on everybody's shoulder. It's just a function of an incredibly busy ER. My job is to help them navigate through that um, and, a, and a chance uh, to deal with people who are rarely heard or very rarely cared for. Uh, secondary to that, Niagara Helps really gives the opportunity to educate the staff, the medical staff, on what it's like to be homeless, what it's like to be addicted. Um, at no given time does anybody choose to be homeless or addicted. Sorry to repeat this, at no given time do we ever choose to be homeless or addicted. Um, it is a rough place to work uh, uh, as far as um, trying to understand all the different um, agencies, different red tape, different ways of having to try to adjust to being homeless. Um, wh what, I, what I bring to the ED and, and to the emergency department here in Niagara Falls um, is a face. I can put a face on what it's like to be homeless. Uh, I, I get a lot of surprising results. You know, people always saying to me, how can you end up homeless? And in any given time, if, if anybody has ever heard this before, any of us are only three months away from being homeless. Try to navigate the healthcare system on top of that, it's tough. Um, a quick story on, on a success that we've had in the, in the ER. A uh, young lady, 22 years old, uh, was in a stairwell uh, here in Niagara and had fallen, um, IV drug user had fallen, made many uh, trips to the ED. Um, when she came in, she was seriously suffering with a knee injury. But because of how stigma on, upon her entry, many visits, many people just saying it's another addict, um, by, by me being able to, to advocate for her with the, with the doctor, we were able to get her entire diagnosis changed we got x-rays, she was in surgery two and a half hours later, and we were able, not just by that opportunity, we were able to get her help through detox into treatment, and she is now free and clear of her drug addiction, of, of pure fentanyl on a daily basis. Um, I'm trying not to be too emotional here, but um, we, there are so many wonderful people. There are so many terrific organizations that help us navigate these systems. Um, and what, what we do is, is we give a kind and empathetic face that understands where they are, why, where they have been, and where they hope to end up. Like I said, no one ever chooses to live this lifestyle. Um, before discharge, we partner with many Niagara agencies to find shelters, nights, long-term housing, opportunities to get clean and sober, places that help uh, with the healing from abuse, safety from human trafficking. Uh, there are many underlying issues that cause people to become homelessness, and at Niagara Helps, our job is to remove some of that stigma and help the homeless navigate the healthcare system 
and find a friendly, safe place. Uh, Thank thanks again for the opportunity uh, to, to share this story with you. Um, it's a big deal, everybody. Uh, uh, if I can be frank, and I'm sorry, you worship. Um, there is a lot happening out there. Um, I am incredibly blessed, number one, to be alive. Uh, and number two, to be working in a position where we're able to vote change every day. Um, but we need your help. And we need the help of the community to continue to do what we're doing. Um, and I, I, I thank you for everything I heard this evening around what you're trying to do uh, for our peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Cronkwright. Uh, what is the uh, direction of council from the uh, from the report uh, that we or the letter that we received? Yes, Councillor Coco. I think Councillor Iannone wants to speak first, but I'll speak after her. Okay, Councillor Iannone. Um, I'm a little emotional, so can she go? Sure. Okay, Thank do you, you. want to go? Yeah. There, there is no ask on this. Um, Councillor Iannone and I joined a webinar uh, a few months ago regarding homelessness, and we heard a doctor, Dr. Hussein and Scott, Scott Conkright, on this webinar, and they told us about this program. So we told them, you know, whatever we can do to help, please contact us. And we didn't hear, hear from them for a while. It was just the start of the program, which has been in many other cities. But um, the doctor got back to us just this past couple of weeks. And we thought we wanted to bring it here so everybody could know about this program. And the reason why I felt it was so important was I quite often hear of um, homeless people, addicted, um, and mentally health uh, challenged people going into the ER and getting discharged at 2 o'clock in the morning with nowhere to go, no transportation, no shoes or no coat. And I said to Dr. Hussein, I said, um, do, do you have something to help the transportation issue or, or a clothes? He said, you know what, that's never happened to us. And I, we, we thought about it and the reason why that's never happened to Niagara Helps is because they never discharged the people that they're advocating for, they wait till the morning, they get all of the services for them, the transportation, the shoes, the clothes, um, the, the connections to housing, because they have an advocate. <coughs> Quite often when people don't have an advocate, they're just put on the street in the middle of the night with no resources. And when I heard about this, this was amazing. And we, we really need to support this. There's a, there is no ask, there's no money, it's just awareness to let people know about what, what, what they're doing. And if any of us can support them in any way, Councillor Iannone and I are going to put some packages together of some basics for, for um, clothes, um, deodorant, toothbrushes, that sort of thing. Um, but I thought it was a very useful program and it really can make a difference in our community, especially after we've heard many of these different uh, presentations tonight. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, May I just stop? Thank you. Um, and when you when you use the, the old saying, by the grace of God go I, mm -hmm. I don't believe when we were teenagers hanging out at Sue and Scott Concrete's house and mm -hmm. going roller skating that we would ever believe that my sister and Scott would go through the same um, challenges. And I am so happy Scott came out on this end. Um, and I congratulate him for wanting to be an advocate at the hospital. I accompanied my sister many times um, to the eMERGE in a drug-induced psychosis. And I, could, I can very clearly understand why um, the, the way they're treated happens. Um, some of the language used, the attitude toward the healthcare staff. I, I think I apologized for my sister a billion times and where the staff would say to me, that's okay, we're used to dealing with this. Um, but there were times she went where I wasn't there as her advocate and she had an entirely different um, experience. And I'm sure Councillor Campbell went through the exact same experiences we did because it is uniform when they go in and the stigma is so bad and so mortifying and so embarrassing. So while there, so while there's for the, for the patient going in and so while there is no ask, I, I would ask anybody around council who would like to donate to what council Lacoco and I, Lacoco and I are doing, there will be two outreach workers, um, as was explained to us, Scott and somebody else there looking at hiring 
And what we're creating is an emergency kit for the back of their car. So if whoever they are helping is discharged, there will be coats of a number of sizes. There will be clothes a number of sizes, socks, which are the most important thing to the homeless. Um, and, and, um, sweatshirts, hoodies, anything you might have extra belonging around. If you'd like to donate it, please contact Councillor Lacoco and I privately, and we will make sure that it goes into this, this box we're creating for the back of Scott's car and the back of the other um, advocate's car. Because it's very important that if they're released out at night in the freezing cold, at least they have some semblance of being able to be warm. So thank you very much. And Scott, thank you very much. You're okay, very thanks. welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all. So do we... Your Worship? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Yes, I just want to add a few comments and support. Uh, there were several times when my daughter was refused admission to the hospital for whatever reasons. And she had to go outside and actually burn herself on the forearm with a cigarette button come back in and say is this a reason enough people need help and i think this is a wonderful way to help them thank you thank you so mr clerk uh is there something procedurally we would do do we receive the letter i would just receive for information okay motion by councillor the coco seconded by councillor campbell oh Okay, uh, to receive uh, all those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Thank you to all. Item 9.15, City of St. Catharines resolution regarding the development approval requirements for landfills. Uh, there's a recommendation that council support the resolution. Motion by Councillor Cario. No, 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 no. I, I had a question. I was no, going to. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, the I was just going to say, well, I can understand why they'd want it. But I think we should just receive and file them, Your Worship, unless you want to support them. Your Worship, I got a question on this. Yes, yes. So um, the bill that they're asking us to, uh, or the resolution that they're asking us to support, goes against the bill that is saying that if you're from another municipality and you're within 3.5 kilometers of a landfill, you, you have a voice. That's that's what the bill says, right? With, yeah, if with you're the, in another municipality and you're within that certain range, then you have a voice. Yes, you have a voice in the other municipality. Right. right. And what they're saying, and what St. Catharines is saying, is we don't want you to have that voice. Right. Yes, but likewise, though, we've got situations in Niagara Falls where St. Catharines and Niagara Lake will have voices in Niagara Falls. So what they're saying is this 3.5 uh, kilometer radius allows other municipalities to have jurisdiction in yours and the the idea is that why would you want another city making decisions about what you're doing in your city and I, that's what they're trying to do which i personally i think i would support this i think i don't know that we would want st catharines and iron lake having something to do with any decisions we make well they're regional facilities though your worship no they're talking about anything uh this is uh, i thought what, it was specific to landfills well, landfills are, they're not just regional, they're private as well. So, you know, we've got some uh, here as well. And they, if they're within that, that distance, they would have something to say with anything that's on that within three and a half kilometers. So. I think we can make our own decision on the motion. Which one should support? Support? Uh, yeah, support the resolution. Yeah. yeah. So that's, and that's the idea is we make our own decisions in our own city. So we got a motion by Councillor Thompson, looking for a second, second by Councillor Strange. Any other discussion to the motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, that passes. Okay, uh, item 9.16, uh, City of Belleville regarding built 218, that council support the city of Belleville's res resolution to keep the existing framework of the Municipal Elections Act. That's the recommendation from council that we support their resolution to keep the existing framework 
of the Municipal Elections Act. Did you want to say anything to that, um, <clears throat> Mr. Clerk? I think they're also looking for funding opportunities. Funding, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Mr. Clark. I just wanted to speak to a couple of things that jumped out at me. Uh, one, with this le proposed legislation, it would eliminate the council's opportunity for ranked ballots. I don't know that that's a concern here. The city of London was the only municipality in Ontario that used it in 2018. But the bigger concern that, that I have and a lot of other clerks around the uh, province have is um, this bill would move nomination day. And you remember... Uh, uh, Councillor Thompson certainly remembers he was always first in line on January 2nd so that he could see his name written on the top of the chalkboard in the lobby downstairs. Uh, but nominations used to open the first day that we were open after the Christmas holidays. Uh, it was last in 2018 when that was moved uh, to the fourth Friday in July. And this really shortened the nomination period. Uh, I think it was to mirror a little bit more of what is done in provincial and federal elections. Uh, the amendment first came out and said that uh, now this new process would be moved to the second Friday in September. And that really puts uh, staff in a bit of a crunch. Uh, you figure that nominations close. If there aren't enough nominations, uh, they have to reopen again. Uh, ballots would then have to be created. We're trying to get uh, advanced polls open as early as possible. Uh, that would be a really tight turnaround to try and get everything in place, test all the voting machines that we have, uh, so on and so forth. So I think that's why some of the clerks in other municipalities uh, and some of the councils in other municipalities are uh, uh, pushing back a little bit with this Bill 218. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Uh, Okay, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, I'm very confused. When I click on the attachment, I get a letter from the City of Belleville talking about the Disabilities Act. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know where we're talking about elections at all. I'm so confused. That's why I said there's funding involved, Your Worship, because in the Be It Therefore result, yes. it says the City of Belleville requests the province of Ontario consider providing funding support and training resources. And it's all about. Um, it's uh, the AOTA. It, yeah, it looks like. A, is, it, is that the wrong link? It looks like accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, unfortunately, I just noticed that myself. Uh, that is the wrong link. I apologize for that. The uh, the mention on in the printed version is obviously talking about the uh, Municipal Elections Act. I think there were two correspondence, two pieces of correspondence originally, from uh, Belleville, and uh, perhaps what we could do is bring them back on the next agenda. Uh, or do you want to just receive them both? That's fine if we just receive them. I mean, we see the one, and the other one we know yeah, it's around fine. the election yeah. changing the rules. Yes, Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I see the other one as well? Um, I'd like to receive them, but I would like to read the other one because I haven't had an opportunity sure, to read we it. we can do that. Is that right? Okay, no problem. So, Councillor Thompson, you make the motion that we receive uh, the uh, resolutions from Belleville. Receive and file. Seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, and with a copy uh, coming to council of the um, that letter, we'll call the vote. All those in oh, Councillor Campbell. Oh, he's voting for it. All those in favor? Ye yes. All those in favor? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we just see the top of your head, Councillor Campbell. It's kind of hard with your hand. You look like a shark with your hand on the top. Is he on the floor? I think he's on the floor. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. There he is. There he is. Okay. Item 9.17, Niagara Regional Council motion around decriminalization of personal possession of illicit drugs. Um, the recommendation is that we receive. I know we've talked about this here before, but uh, what's the will of Council? Councilor Lococo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh. I talked with our clerk a while ago about the um, bringing all of our questions back, and he hasn't received a lot of the responses yet. So receive and file is fine for this, just knowing that the region did pass it, and when we get the information, it will answer all of our questions. Thank you. Okay. And, and it should be clear the region wasn't uh, asking them to decriminalize it. They said to look at it. Right. They weren't uh, make, taking a position on it. Okay, uh, we'll call the vote. All Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor to receive and file? Okay, and that's approved, including the shark. There we go. Yep, great. 
Item 9.18, Niagara Region's new restrictions on dining. Now, for this one, if you would, oh, I should have handed these out sooner. Um, I'll uh, just give you a copy for it. I don't want you to have to read each other and get too close to each other. So um, I'll read this. I'll read this. Uh, so I've been working very closely. Okay, let me back up. So we received so many calls and emails and online stuff and a lot of the restaurants hospitality industry is very very concerned about a lot of things and i know we got to walk this fine line uh, i spoke with former medical officer of health i've spoken with uh, law enforcement by law enforcement regional uh cao i've spoken with the media spoken with absolutely everybody before putting this together uh and so Maybe we, I'll just read it real quickly and I see if, you, if we'll get support for it. Whereas, and for Councillor Inoni and Campbell at home, whereas in relation to Section 22 of Ontario's Health Protection and Promotion Act, where Niagara Regional Public Health Chief Medical Officer, should say uh, acting, Dr. Herji ordered that restaurants and bars enforce that people are able, only able to dine with those living in their households or those essential to their physical or mental health. So this speaks to the idea that you have to all be from the same household to be able to go to, to dinner. That's what this addresses. Whereas the medical chief, essentially, whereas the chief medical officer of health indicated in his letter to regional counselors that it must be emphasized that operators of restaurant establishments do not seem to be responsible for infection spreading. Rather, it's members of the public who are misusing freedom to dine in restaurants. Whereas evidence has shown that the majority of COVID-19 cases in Niagara have not occurred in restaurants, whereas restricting dining to family members only will have severe financial hardship on restaurants and is not consistent with provincial orders and guidelines. Whereas restaurant and bar owners have spent a significant amount of money and resources on making their employees and premises COVID safe, whereas the new Section 22 issued by Niagara Regional Public Health are not consistent with provincial guidelines, leading to confusion amongst businesses across Niagara. As it currently stands, the provincial COVID-19 framework in orange level restricts diners to four diners per table, and the regional medical officer of health order indicated that no more than six people be seated at a table. So conflicting uh, rules cause confusion. Whereas many hospitality workers are laid off and financially struggling along with business owners in this industry, and whereas the hospitality industry directly accounts for 13% of all Niagara jobs. Whereas each level of restriction has devastating ramifications for the people working in these industries. Whereas these restrictions will make the problem worse by driving people together into situations where no contact tracing, sanitization, face coverings or physical distancing is enforced. Whereas business and business leaders were not consulted on the best direction, whereas many other types of businesses are allowing significantly more people into their establishments in a safe way, whereas this approach didn't work in Peel and numbers continued to escalate, whereas there's no evidence that this type of measure will improve public safety, and whereas restaurants are more than just eating and drinking places, they're places to celebrate and enjoy family and friends and are an integral part of the fabric of our committee. Therefore, be it resolved that the public health department step up inspections and enforcement of provincial COVID-19 protocols for those in non-compliance and under provincial orders, that compliance with the provincial framework be made the priority, and that public health immediately halt the directive of dining only with those in the same household in order to avoid unnecessary business losses and casualties, and further, that a copy of this resolution immediately be sent to all the members of Niagara Regional Council, senior staff at the region of Niagara, and all local area municipalities. 
What is that noise? Oh, that's that thing. Okay. Infuser. Councillor Strange, I think we got to turn it off. Maybe push the little button. Yeah. Thank you for this, Mr. Mayor. I think when um, Dr. Hergy came out with this and put Niagara in the orange zone, I guess it's just you know all these restaurants, um, establishments, coffee, cafes, whatever. Tim Hortons. They all been following the rules since the beginning. They've been shut down at the beginning. Then they get protocols, masks. Uh, hand sanitizers, uh, some are taking uh, t temperatures, and they've been following the rules. Mm -hmm. And our cases have been low. Uh, to do something like this really, really crushes the hospitality industry. It really does. You know, restaurant owners, servers, cooks, bartenders, uh, cashiers, uh, you know, at Tim Hortons. Can you imagine people who've been hanging out, and they do it, and you see the, the groups of people, the four or five or the six groups of people that go to Tim Hortons every morning. And they can't do that anymore. And they know who they are. And it, it's unreal, because it's, it's, it's causing a, a social anxiety now to them. They're getting uh, uh, they're at mental health risk. They have to go out and they have to socialize. Um, you know, th this is common sense. If you're, if you're not feeling well and you're checking your temperature, and you're, you don't go out. And, um, you know, for, for a group of people, whether they're roofers or something like that, and they're working together all day, and they want to go out for lunch and go to Yanks or whatever they may go have some pizza and wings, and they can't do that because they're not from the same household. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really unfortunate that it's come to this. You know, you, you, we love Costco, and it, we're glad that they're here. But you see, there's about 500 people there. You get 500 in Walmart, but yet I can't go... With, with a fellow counselor to go uh, for a slice of pizza. It's ridiculous. So I don't know how they're coming up with these numbers and you know, you can, you can go to school, all these kids, thousands of kids go to school and they travel on buses in different, different schools in these buses, but yet I can't drive somebody to, in my car and go to a restaurant and have some pizza and wings. It's, it's very unfortunate. We've been following all the protocols, they, everything. Ever since we started this, the center street where we, we blocked that off to, to get patios and separate people. It's been great. It's been a huge hit. And now you're punishing all these restaurants and bars and establishments of Tim Hortons for doing, for doing this. It's, it really is ridiculous. And if there's got to be some kind of something that we can do ourselves, whether it's like this... this Entering City Hall, where we fill out a little questionnaire, whether you've been in there, so you can download it on your phone, or they have something at the restaurant. You know, and, and even if the, one of the restaurant owners or, or somebody at the door has one of those temperature guns, that you get a Canadian Tire for $25. If, you, if you're over 38 degrees, you can't come in. I'm sorry. We'll see you, you know, in 14 days. But to, to do this and hurt your economy it, and, and hurt business, it's ridiculous. So I'll support anything that we can do to help these, these people. Thank you for that, Councillor. Councilor Cario. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Yep. Go ahead, Councilor. You've got the floor. Um, just to add to this, Your Worship, I've talked to many of the restaurants that I happen to go to, uh, obviously following the guidelines. Not one of them, maybe one of them, has been checked by the health department. They're not even checking. They weren't checking before. They're not checking. So they put everybody in the same bag, and they're penalizing all the people that have followed all of the guidelines to the T and treating everyone the same. And I agree with Councillor Strange. Go into Walmart, go into, there, go into all those other stores. There's people in there like flies. They're not checking. They don't make you write your name down and your address and your phone number like they do in the restaurants. They just let you go in and do whatever. Go buy a couple of the schools. Kids are all playing in the, in the uh, playground when I drove by a couple of weeks ago at, on Valleyway. No masks. They're just running around playing with each other. I, uh, anyway, the, um, they're just looking for fair treatment, Your Worship. The uh, people in this industry feel like they're being targeted and they're not being treated the same as all the other businesses. Um, construction workers work together all day. Two or three guys on a team work together all day. They can't go and have lunch together. They got to, one goes here, one goes, they got to go somewhere else because they, they can't even go sit together. They've been working all day together. It's ridiculous. So anyway, they're only asking to be treated the same as they're treating everyone else. Um, I, I saw the premier on television today uh, talking about, well, we can't touch the schools. 
well, there's 300 and some odd cases in schools in Toronto. Uh, but we can't touch the schools because it's important for them to go to school. Well, it's important for the, these people to be able to work and pay for their businesses. Or when they open the doors and let them go back to work, there'll be nobody left. They won't be opening their restaurants again. Thank you for that, Councillor. Councillor Worship? Yes, Councillor Campbell? Yes, uh, I'd like to make some comments. Uh, my wife and I have been doing our best to support the local restaurant uh, industry. Um, and I have to tell you, 100% of the restaurants we've attended are not putting anyone in a risky position. Uh, and if we had walked into a restaurant that we felt uncomfortable with, we would have left. And I, I heard today, I can't remember if it was Manitoba or Saskatchewan, hired a private investigator company. And they're going to find these people who are not following the rules, the restaurants, the businesses, not following the rules, and they're going to find them $25,000. So I agree with what you're putting forward. I think that we need to come up with some solutions of enforcement. And one way or the other, we can't allow them to fall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've all got the emails, we all got the phone calls, and I really feel for the restaurant industry, the workers, the owners. Um, I understand that they're concerned. Sometimes when we look at the rules, they just don't make sense when you compare one sector to another, for example, the construction industry or, or shopping or whatever. Sometimes they just don't make sense, and I think we're seeing that throughout the whole pandemic. I really don't think it's the place of politicians to be making medical decisions. I think that the medical experts, we rely on experts, that they should be making the, the medical decisions. So what I would like to see is some dialogue between the restaurant owners and the medical officers, throw in the politicians if you want, but the medical officers and um, the restaurants, because then they can say, the medical officer can say, these are the things that we're concerned about and we have to deal with. And then the restaurant owners can say, well, these are the things that we're doing. We've gone overboard on these. These are all of the different things that are making the experience better. So I really want to see dialogue between those two um, to find out what the concerns are and come up with solutions. I really don't want to send this resolution and just say retract it. I want some communication happening between the two of them. And the other part, what I'd like to see is enforcement at the regional level and at our city level. Because we haven't been enforcing, we've just been pushing education, hoping that people would do what they were supposed to and do the right thing, and it's not happening. So we have to enforce if people aren't doing the right thing. And um, I'm not gonna support the motion as it is. I think it is an issue, and I want to support our restaurant industry and owners and workers, but I think the way to do it is through dialogue and communication. So I appreciate your comments, and because I'm the architect of this, or the author of it, I'll, I'll respond. Um, you mentioned that we don't do enforcement. That's not true. We do enforcement. Matter of fact, I'm sure you must have heard about the big Airbnb that was busted this weekend. That was our staff coordinating with the police. So we are doing enforcement. And, uh, uh, and this is different because this is not enforceable. Section 21 is a, is, um, um, is a directive from the, public, the acting medical officer of health. It doesn't fall, it doesn't uh, in any way compel our bylaw or the police to enforce it, just public health. That's the problem with that kind of an executive directive. It doesn't do that. The other thing uh, is you mentioned politicians shouldn't be the ones, should be the medical health people. And I say the medical health people are part of the equation and the uh, restaurant owners are the other one. And the politician is the conduit bringing them together because it's obvious the medical officer of health did zero consultation with the industry that he's putting down all these types of measures that are going to put them out of business. It's obvious that's not the person you want. You go to the people at the front line and you ask them. You don't tell them, you ask them. It's how you work in business. You always go to the customer and you ask them. You don't tell them or you'll be out of business. 
In this case, the region is going to be out of business if we go down this road. It's wrong. It's flawed. And the other thing that I said to the media today is exactly that. You need to get a small committee of hospitality people, and those are the ones you ask. You don't dictate. Dictate is a guaranteed failure. So uh, that's why this was put together the way it was. So I just want to clarify, I've already said exactly the consulting part, which has not taken place, and that's why the pushback is as it is. I've spoken with, I can't tell you how many people crying on the phone because they're going to lose their house because it's been eight months of hell, and you've got people making decisions who have never taken a hit to their pay, making decisions for people who haven't gotten pay, who are about to lose their houses with young kids now that are employing other people. So this goes way beyond uh, trying to control the virus because this is where the cure is worse than the cause. This is where you're not looking at the mental or financial health of the people as you try to worry about the physical health. Don't worry about it because here we've already talked about situations of people taking their lives for different reasons. This is the kind of bad decision making that pushes people into bad decisions. So I, this is going to go as it goes and you vote against it, then you vote against it. That's your... your Prerogative. Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I do want to put on record that I do f feel for the restaurant industry, the whole hospitality. I just don't think that this is the way to go. And we do differ in opinions, and that's fine. We do. But feelings don't help the restaurant industry. Support does. Yes. yes. Councillor, uh, I've got Councillor Dabrowski. Next? I've got Councillor Strange. And then I think I heard Councillor Iannone. I always put health first. And I know around this table we all do to Councillor Campbell's point, so do all of the restaurants. I've been to countless number of restaurants over the past two or three months. Everybody's done contract tracing. Menus aren't handed out anymore. They're done through a QR code. There's no salt and pepper shakers on the tables. Everybody's wearing a mask or a shield, whatever the case may be. Restaurants are, are wiping and sanitizing. They, they've hired extra staff, so they have extra expenses now. They're only allowed to have 50% or 30%. Half the time, I'm, I'm not even sure of the rules anymore because you're changing on a, a regular basement's basis. The point is, the restaurants don't have any more time. Time's running out. We're, we're getting into the winter season. Tourists aren't coming to the area. We have to rely on locals. And if, like Councillor Strange mentioned, we as a council can't go for, a, for a, an afternoon lunch or a bite to eat after council as a group, that will kill the restaurant industry. It will, it will simply annihilate all of the restaurants that are already being affected negatively. They can't afford to lose another one month or two months or three months of, of business. And this will just ultimately kill, kill the industry. Um, I'll support your recommendation full, full force. Like I said, I, I know the restaurants are taking the health precautions seriously. Um, it's a huge fine if they don't, never mind the fine if they have um, people that aren't from the same household at, at a table. But, I don't think we have time to discuss this any further. I, I think we, we need to move forward with, with that motion and that recommendation. And we need to get people working. We need to continue to have people working. Because in the new year, if we don't, there won't be any restaurants left. There won't be any jobs. And people won't be able to pay their mortgages. And they won't be able to pay their bills. And it will be an ugly, ugly situation. So I think we can make it a lot better if we make the right decisions. We are putting health first. But again, there's a lot of contradictions, a lot of inconsistencies. You can walk into Costco, and they are social distancing. They are, they are wearing masks, but it doesn't make sense that they can have three or 400 people in their establishment, and we can't have 30 people in a restaurant. They're socially distanced, that they're wearing masks, that they're sanitizing properly. So anyway, I, I support where you're going with it and appreciate you bringing this forward. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Strange, and then Iannone. Yeah, through you, and, and to add on to that, there, there have been actually restaurants who've been taking extreme measures and only allowing Niagara Falls residents into their place of establishment to make sure. And most of these establishments, bars, restaurants, whatever, it's all locals. They know them every day. You know, they'll, they'll tell you who they are. They know their addresses. They know what time they come in. Tim Hortons, every day, every corner, you can see these same group of six to 10 people coming in and they're all with each other. At the beginning of the pandemic, or in the middle of the pandemic, they said, okay, you're, you, have, you can have your bubble of 10 to 15 people, stay within that bubble. And now you can't even have two different households. I couldn't go with my mom to a restaurant and eat, which is ridiculous. You know, so something has to change. You know, you're, you're causing more um, mental health issues. And you, you look at BC, there's more suicides, death by suicides and, and, uh, and overdoses than there are COVID deaths. 
And it's because of circumstances like this that you're not letting them go outside, letting them go out and, and go for, for a donut at Tim Hortons or go for a slice of pizza at Antica. I'm trying to name all the businesses that have been sending the emails to me. But, uh, you know, I, I, I agree we have to be doing something. I think this is a great approach. So I'll, I'll make the motion or second it whenever you'd like. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Anoni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, while we are having this conversation, I turned on Global. And the ticker on the bottom of Global is COVID-19 pandemic. This is Global National. Calls for stricter rules in Ontario as hospitals near capacity. I, I really think that we are out of our expertise here. And, I, and I'm going to agree to disagree with you. We are not medical experts. Um, we, and, and you're saying, and I heard, just heard Councillor Dabrowski say that if they break the rules, they get a huge fine. I'm sorry, but I didn't know we were fining. Um, you talked about there was enforcement at this Airbnb. What did we find them? Because I have been critical from start to now that we are not advertising. If you break this rule, if you do, and I and I personally think it's the business's responsibility to enforce social distancing, um, enforce masking, um, enforce every protocol they can to keep people safe. Not every business in this city's done that, and those that haven't done that are costing those that have put all that money in and and are doing it right and now have to have the threat of going down to this smaller bubble. But what are we finding them? Who, who have we find and what was the amount? Uh, do we have anybody uh, on that can answer the question about some? Yeah, Chief Boudelier, yes, please. So, Mr. Mayor, um, to the councillor, so the latest find that's been happening was there was an Airbnb um, that was found to be in violation of the numbers of the COVID. They had more than uh, 10 people inside the building. So each one of them received the fine under the COVID protocols, which I believe is in and around the $800 mark. Don't quote me exactly because I'm not 100% sure. Um, those were all part ones that were issued to each individual. Um, and then the owner of the establishment or the rental, the VRU will be receiving a part three, which will then have him appear to JP and whatever that decision is made. And according to the rules, it can be anywhere between 10 to $100,000. So who have we fined before them? Because quite frankly, Mr. Mayor, I think we should have had it front page of the paper, every, every bit of social media that you could adhere to. If you break these rules, this is what we're going to fine you. And if we can find them more than eight hundred dollars, find them more than eight hundred. Councillor, we're speaking to the resolution, okay? That's what we're speaking to. Well, I, and that's what I'm speaking to. No, you're not. You you're just, speaking to yeah, what happened no, in the summer. You just answered Councillor Lacoco, and you said there's enforcement. I'm sorry. This is the first time I've heard that. You just the the chief just said they were fined. I didn't know we were fining. As a matter of fact, I pulled prior articles where we said we're just educating. When did we start finding? Because I'm not gonna support your resolution. I, I don't think that we are in the role to make these decisions. And I feel sick for Dr. Herji, whose sole job is to make sure people don't die. That's his sole job. He has to go to bed at night knowing the decisions he makes causes death or doesn't. We're not in that role. Our job is to enforce our, our bylaws. So I, I think that we're way out of our out of our circle or what our what our job description is. And quite frankly, we came to you another at another time, Councillor Lococo and I, the day before a special meeting of the region, and asked you to ask this council to enforce masking. And you said no, it was going to go to the region the next day and it was the region's job to decide. Well, I think it's the region's job to decide. That's where Dr. Herji is speaking. If you wanted us to support your motion tonight, you should have Dr. Herji here talking to us about um, medical information that none of us are aware of. He didn't make that decision in a vacuum. He made that decision because he believes he's saving lives. And I don't think it's our job to supersede him. So I'm not going to support your motion. Okay. I'm just going to, what's that? No. So a couple things, uh, Councillor, I'm going to respond to some of your comments. Uh, I've got you, Councillor Campbell, I've got you up next. Uh, you know, we're talking out of two sides of our mouth here. We're saying that's not our job, but we talked about opioid tonight, talked about homelessness, we talked about death by suicide tonight, 
and yet we're not uh, going to support this. I've heard people say the decision uh, is not up to politicians, it's up to the doctor, but yet when the doctor said no masks are not mandatory, it was the politicians who made it mandatory. So I'm hearing two sides of your mouth. You're trying to say that hospitalizations on, on a national news media, hospitalizations are not full here or even close to full in Niagara. We've been doing a great job. Niagara Falls has never led the charge and we've never <clears throat> not enforced our, the rules, the, the provincial COVID protocols. We've always said education over compli where, uh, compliance, over conviction is what we said. We never ever said we're not going to. We said our first role is to educate. That's what we said. So let's not twist what was going on here. And Niagara Falls, despite the fact that we've got millions of visitors, we've never led the pack all summer with our numbers. We've always done an excellent job, all things considered. I'm proud of how hard everybody worked and all of our staff. And Councillor, because you're not aware of bars and places that are charged, doesn't mean it's not happening. It's not your role to be aware. It's the police and our bylaw enforcement's oh. job. And there are places that have already been charged, and there are places that have already been shut down that have already taken place. So because you're not aware doesn't mean it's not happening. Can you send us that list? Because that I don't have the list because it's not my role either. That's with it the police and the bylaw. So no, it I don't have a list. Oh my God. Okay, that's fine, Councillor. Just vote side against side it. Go to, vote against it. Okay, yeah, is there any other comments we have of Council for this, yep. please? Okay, we're going to call the vote. I've got a motion by Councillor Strain. I just want to call my quick, yep. too. Just about, about people going to house parties and all that stuff. This is what's okay, going to cause that. This is what's going to cause that. Because people are you're closing places at 9. People aren't allowed to be together. And say, okay, I'll just meet you at your house now. That's how you're going to get congregations of 10 to 20 people at their houses. That's what's going to happen because of what we're doing and what we're implementing at the bar. That's what's going to happen if we don't, if we don't save them. Now that's what's going to happen. Okay, 9 o'clock, let's all go to my house. And all of us can get together and do this. We can have a couple of beers and some pizza or whatever like that. So that's what's going to, that's what's going to happen. So we have to do something. We have to save our hospitality industry um, before it's too late. And I'm gonna, I've got Councillor Dabrowski. I've got to want to go to Councillor Campbell because he's been patiently waiting. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, you know, what's really messing this whole process up is the people who are not following the rules. And I think that the key here is we need to be in a position to put further businesses, uh, not businesses, further uh, inf uh, enforcement to provide fines for those people who are not ob observing the rules. It, it's, it, it comes down to that. I mean, it blows me away how many times I go into a grocery store and there are arrows on the, on the floor and people are coming the opposite direction. And just they're not following the rules. And so they need to pay for that. I'm sorry. I support you 100%. Thank you, Councillor. And that's why, and it says in the resolution that we step up inspections and enforcement. Yes. We say exactly yes. that. And, and the other thing is we ask our regional uh, um, acting medical officer of health to follow the provincial framework and the reason, because the confusion. So right now, the province is saying you're allowed four people at a table. The region is saying you're allowed six people at a table. People are calling us saying, which is it? They're confused and confused yeah. people do yeah. nothing. This is, yeah. we're not in step with what's going on at the province. People are confused. Businesses are gonna go out of business, but thank you for that, uh, those comments, Councillor. Councillor Dabrowski. Absolutely, thank um, you. Just quickly, 205 active cases in the Niagara region 0. 0.0004 times 500,000, just ballpark. That's 36 active cases in Niagara Falls. That's the amount of bars and restaurants that are probably already closed and there's probably 50 or 100 more that are about to go out of business. So again, health first, the numbers don't lie. I think it's a wise decision. I think what you're, you're bringing forward is wise. And if uh, the region doesn't, doesn't agree, then so be it. But um, I think that the numbers don't lie. I think the, the city's done a phenomenal job. And Councillor Campbell just said people aren't following the rules, but 
just before that, he said he hasn't been to a restaurant where they weren't following the rules. I, again, I've been to restaurants that are all following the rules. Bars, restaurants have invested thousands of dollars in PPE. Um, they lost that, but the staff's doing a great job as well. So I, I think we'd be do, doing a disservice to the industry. I think it would be irresponsible not trying to at least help the businesses here stay afloat and keep jobs going here in the, in the falls. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make two points. Um, I thought uh, Premier Ford said that he wanted the municipalities, the medical officers, to make decisions within their own municipality, so that's why it's different in different places. And the other thing is all of the restaurants, which have been very few that I have been to, uh, are practicing um, enormous health concerns, um, having um, disinfectant at the doors, doing contact tracing, removing um, chairs and tables so th there's less people in it. Th they are doing a great job of what I've seen. I just can't support this motion to say we want Dr. Herji to retract it. I would like to see some dialogue. And for clarity, it's retracting the part where he says you have to all be from the same household. That's the part that we're asking him to retract. And simply, I've got a situation today. I mean, I worked all day with someone at City Hall here. We couldn't grab a sandwich afterward together. And yet my daughter's at university. She's going to come home and her and I can't go out. Councillor Strange lives in a different house than his mom. He can't take his mom out. So then there's the regular seniors that go to uh, McDonald's every morning or Tim Hortons every morning. And these people, a lot of them are widowers. They've got, they're suffering from isolation. They're sad. It's been eight months. We're coming into Christmas. They can't even see their friends. It's a real sad situation. There's no reason for it. They tried it in Peel. It was a failure. The numbers continued to go up because exactly what Councillor Strange said, when you tell me I can't do this, you don't stop it. You just move the problem somewhere else. So now they're going to go home and do it where there's no contact tracing, no distancing, no sanitizing. And it's, that's the problem that we're having that's making it even worse. It's a good idea, but an unintended negative outcome. And that's why things like that aren't working because you're not talking to the frontline people who run the restaurants. You got people who have no clue about restaurants making decisions about them, and that's why that fails. But I appreciate everybody's opinions. At the end of the day, we're going to call the vote, and that's what's going to determine what happens. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And opposed? Councillor Campbell, you were for or opposed? <laughs> He's pushing a lot of buttons, but... I'm four. Okay, thank you. Because your timing was off, so I just wanted to make certain. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you for that. Okay, moving along. 9.19 Downtown BIA hiring process of a board employee. Conflict. Yep, Councillor uh, Lacoco has a conflict. We'll give her a second to uh, leave the room. Okay, so we received a letter from the uh, downtown BIA uh, chair of the board uh, in regard to concerns about uh, an employee that was hired and some uh, possible influence that might have taken place. Uh, what's the will of council on this matter? Uh, Councillor Strange? Uh, you know, we just got that, I think we got this letter this afternoon and I don't know much about it. Like, they're, It looks like they're, the BIA is it the down, yeah, the downtown BIA is looking for reimbursement of what it cost them to hire an employee of $6,500. And there's concerns of an interference and undue influence of one or more city councilors in the hiring process of this former employee, which I imagine they paid out $6,500. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if we're open to, to discuss this here while well, obviously doing that, but should we, should we put this into a, uh, I don't know if, if our legal wants to get involved here and give us some advice? Yeah. Why, don't, why don't we do that before we say too okay. much on that one? Thank yeah. you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Lustig, could you, uh, a suggestion, what should, should we be referring this to you or what do you recommend uh, that we do? Well, the question actually uh, came up today through uh, the clerk about whether it should be in camera. And we took a look at section 239 of the Municipal Act dealing with um, the um, 
exceptions to the rule, which is that you hold all public meetings uh, open um, and only go into camera for the exceptions that are listed. And you only do so if you wish to do so. And we couldn't fit this within that, although I suppose you could make the argument opposite to the way we looked at it, Bill and I. But we didn't think that this was necessarily litigation, um, nor did we see that it was a identifiable person that was an employee of the municipality. So we, we came to the conclusion that it didn't fit into uh, the in-camera exceptions. Um, you can choose to do the opposite and have it in camera if you want to discuss it on the basis that if you think it involves um, a identifiable person or a, um, uh, a um, potential litigation, that's, that's your choice. That wasn't our judgment, and so that was the way we looked at it. So if you look at it the way we looked at it, it's a request for a contribution or a payment to um, a group that um, has asked to be paid, they say, because of some uh, actions uh, by members of council. And I suggest to you that you can decide to um, not pay them the money and um, go, just go to that point, and nothing further. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, council, yeah, uh, what's the direction of council change? Well, I, I, I just don't know if we should be, we should be reaching out to um, Mr. Charbonneau and asking for more information on this or give it, refer it to staff or legal to find out and get information. So why don't we do that? Maybe we refer it to staff to follow up and investigate what's going on. Maybe something to that effect. Okay. Yeah. I'll refer it to staff and, and try to, I guess, get as much information as I can from this. Okay. Owners, yeah. Like yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I know. So, okay, uh, Councilor Cario. Well, I, just... I just saw the letter late today as well. It's pretty serious accusations. I mean, I think this is as serious, if not more serious, than anything we've seen before. So, I hate to say where I think this is going to end up, but uh, I think this is good. This is, you know. They're suggesting influence, that someone was influencing a situation, and now they're asking us to pay the money that they had to pay out for whatever reason on this hiring that they say was influenced by some members of our council. So we absolutely need an investigation. I'm just not sure it's fair to our staff to have them do the investigation. Um, I think we should maybe take a step back and think about how we want to deal with this. We could send it to staff, but I think I know where it's going to end up. It's going to end up being investigated, and I'm not sure it's, in, it's fair to have our staff investigate it. So I'm glad to uh, go along with the motion and send it to staff. I'd like to get it looked at right away, and then uh, if it has to be uh, taken further, we'll bring it back at the next meeting. If it's in camera, it's in camera, whatever it becomes legal. But it's a very serious accusation, Your Worship. So I think we'll have to have it looked at and investigated. Thank you for that. Do we have any other uh, comments of council? Okay, so it looks like there's no more at this point. So more questions than answers, lots of concerns. So there's a motion uh, by Councillor Strange that we refer this to staff to be further investigated, report to come back on I'd, our options. I'd, well, I'd like to bring it back. If, if not, hopefully like an in-camera on the next meeting would yeah. be nice. So to bring it back, uh, including in-camera, if we need to get legal advice. Exactly. Okay. Uh, second by Councillor Kerry. Yeah, and yeah. could we add, Your Worship, that, um, that we um, correspond to the downtown people and tell them what we're doing, that we're going to have a look at it and we'll get back to them? Okay, and then we do that as well. Mr. Clerk, you've got that? Okay. So we've got motion second. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's uh, Councillor Campbell. Yeah, okay, sir, there's a delay in your camera. I see the problem. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you on that one. Um, in camera, uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have uh, items for ratification? Oh yeah, do you wanna grab, uh, yeah, sorry about that.
Yes, so council met earlier or council met earlier today uh, in camera for a few items for ratification purposes. It's that the city accept an offer uh, to purchase 2.385 acres of land in the Montrose Business Park at a cost of uh, $75,000 per acre. Okay. Mo motion by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we ratify the in-camera items. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Uh, motion by Councillor Pierangelo, the bylaws be given a first, second, and third reading. All those, uh, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Uh, new business, Councillor Pierangelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, Your Worship, you probably have already addressed the Poppy Project, did you? Uh, which one, I'm sorry? The Poppy Project? Uh, no, I did not address the it. Niagara Falls Museum? Not, not today, I, and I should have, uh, but, okay. I, but I didn't. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, it ties in with Remembrance Day, Your Worship, so I, I, I just wanted some acknowledgement of the people involved in the Poppy Project. Uh, Niagara Falls uh, History Museum, along with um, uh, Stick and Needles, I believe, which is a local group that, um, mm -hmm. uh, that deals in uh, gilding, I believe. And they put, out, um, uh, they put out correspondence to anyone who wanted to knit or crochet poppies that they wanted to make into uh, large art displays. Uh, lo and behold, Your Worship, they got back, I believe it was 11,000 11, poppies. Yes. Um, they also got back poppies from every single province in Canada. Yes. Uh, as well as 25 different uh, states in the U.S. Um, and I believe there's a couple countries in there, like Denmark sent some over, uh, New Zealand sent some over. Um, just a massive, massive undertaking, Your Worship. I, I believe there was over 45 hundred uh, man hours or, or person hours in terms of uh, knitting and crocheting as well as almost uh, 700 hours put into uh, assembling the displays. So I really didn't want that to go uh, unnoticed yeah. and, and um, I mean if, uh, if a letter would be appropriate Your Worship then I think perhaps a, a letter of acknowledgement, um, a thank you letter, a letter of congratulations as well should be sent not only to the Niagara Falls uh, History Museum, but to all who supported uh, the Poppy Project. So, um, I mean, if you need that by way of a motion, I'd be happy to make that. Let's do that. But it was an unbelievable display. I know it's something that's going to continue on year after year, and it made me quite proud, actually, to see it, Your Worship, come out of Niagara Falls. So. And I thank you, and I can't believe all the details you remembered. That's amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and we also even had two territories, as well as all 10 provinces. Uh, send, which is amazing like you said nobody they had no idea where this was going to go and it right. just blew and they some of the stories they said the heartfelt stories of people, about people that served overseas yes, people wrote in letters as yeah. well when they sent their poppies in yeah because for a lot of people and especially now we know during this COVID they're suffering from mental health they're lonely a lot sure. of, too much cortisol too much sadness and 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 they're thinking about and it's a chance an outlet when you can write you know it's an outlet right right, right. so or, or knit or crochet you know that's terrific so so a motion by Councillor yep, Peter Angelo, sure. second by Councillor Strange, that we uh, send a letter of uh, gratuity, thank them for all the efforts that they made on behalf of the city. Mm -hmm. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's uh, approved unanimously. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention as well, Your Worship, that if anyone wants to go to the Niagara Falls History Museum, there's quite a nice, uh, there's quite a nice write-up on, on everything that was done for the Poppy Project. Um, but just to continue on with the Remembrance Day theme, uh, this year, Your Worship, we had to have a virtual Remembrance Day. Right. Typically, Niagara Falls has two celebrations. We have one at Chippewa Arena, and then we have one at the Gale Center. And we usually budget, I think it's around $20,000 for, for the two events. Um, we had a virtual one this year just because of COVID. But I, I, I thought of a way, Your Worship, that perhaps we can repurpose some of the funds uh, that we didn't actually spend on Remembrance Day mm -hmm. this year. On the Niagara Veterans Memorial Highway, we have these signs there, and there's, uh, there's one, um, if you're headed westbound, so if you're coming from the border and you're headed westbound, it's right before you get to Stanley Avenue on your right-hand side. And if you're actually traveling the other way, so if you're headed eastbound, it's right before Drummond Road, and it's on your right-hand side again. Mm -hmm. and, and what it does is it signifies the fact that we've already 
dedicated that highway as Niagara Veterans Memorial Highway. The signs, though, Your Worship, they're pr probably, I would imagine, around 15 years yeah. old, and uh, they're quite small. Um, I think they're only two by six, is what Mr. Billado told me, so two feet by six feet. And Your Worship, my only thought was, I, I think it would be a great gesture to our veterans, um, you know, to remember the sacrifices that they made and repurpose some of the funds that we didn't actually get to spend on a celebration by putting up some bigger mm -hmm. signs on the highway so that, you know, people, like, we can have that highway acknowledged. If anyone has been on the 417, which is the connecting highway between 401 and Ottawa, you'll notice that on the 417, mm -hmm. they have giant sized billboards that designate that as Veterans Memorial Highway. And, and our signs are, are quite smaller in comparison, Your Worship. So um, I, I think it'd be a great gesture on our behalf to repurpose some of the funds and, and to put some bigger signs out there. And I would still make that motion. Did you want them to come back with uh, options on the sizing kind of thing? Or? I, I think Mr. Billado, Mr. Nickel would be great at doing something like that, yeah. Um, and then we could choose one of them, Your Worship. Great. Yeah. Okay. That, that, uh, that can be part of the motion. Okay. Thanks. Well, no problem. Thank you. for That's a great idea, actually. Councillor uh, Peter Angelo made the motion that we uh, take some of the money that we did not spend this year uh, for our Remembrance Day ceremony and repurpose it into bigger signs uh, that would be more respectful, noticeable on the 420 for Niagara uh, Memorial Veterans Highway. And staff to come back with a recommendation, something nice and big and make us proud. And nothing against the other ones, but you're right, they're easy to miss. Yeah. They're very small. Um, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. Um, we'll call, if there's no further discussion on that one, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. That's it? That's all for oh, me. Wow. Councillor Dabrowski. Yeah, I'm pretty shocked too. But yeah, um, congrats to uh, the museum. I know they were featured on CTV Toronto, yeah, CBC, Breakfast Television, so very well received. Um, hot off the heels of the Spooky Awards, everybody's favorite Halloween <laughs> Awards. Um, I know the Winter Festival of Lights um, has kind of merged with Niagara Falls Tourism. In light of that, the Sparkle Lighting Awards, it's an award ceremony that um, invited residents to decorate their homes for the holidays and just like exactly what we did with the Spooky Awards, members of the public were able to drive around the city, check out all the cool holiday decorations, vote on them, etc. There was awards handed out. I was thinking, and uh, Ms. Moldenhauer in uh, REC and I were talking and she's had preliminary discussions with Niagara Falls Tourism and the Winter Festival of Lights, but I was hoping that the city um, would make official the Sparkle Lighting Awards, kind of uh, we would be the ambassadors and the spearheaders of um, the Sparkle Lighting Awards. We have a, a plan and a strategy in place. We can basically replicate everything we did for the Spooky Awards and do it for the Sparkle Lighting Awards. So I, I'd ask council to support um, the city of Niagara Falls becoming the um, lead on the Sparkle Lighting Awards. Maybe Ms. Moldenhauer might want to um, discuss or, or talk about a few key points about it. But And I would also ask maybe for a $5,000 budget just to help with awards that we're handing out to residents, um, any online or, or social media marketing that we do as well. But I'd like to throw that on the table. I think obviously with Christmas looking a bit different this year, such as every other holiday and birthday and celebration has this year. It'll just give residents another opportunity to socially distance and enjoy what, uh, what we have offering in the city. So Best like snowman, too. Best snowman? Best snowman. If I eat a we couple more meatballs, I mean, you could you know, dress me up in white and put me on somebody's front lawn. But yeah, I'd like to uh, put that motion forward. And Ms. Moldenhauer, if you'd like, if you'd like to speak to it, feel free. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Moldenhauer, did you want to speak to the uh, City of Niagara Falls Sparkle Awards? Yes, um, the recreation and culture were um, ready to go if council would like to, to go in this direction. And we plan to start planning on Monday and just get the program rolling out as soon as we can. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, I want to say, uh, Councillor Dabrowski, if, if you do it, and, and along with our staff together, the way you did the Sparkle Awards, Man, we got a winner. And especially of all times, when people are looking for things they can do as a family that's safe, yeah. I mean, you can do it in the bubble of your car, and you can drive around, and you can see the houses. And when we went around and gave the awards to all the Spooky Award recipients, wow, I mean, it was contagious. The whole street was on fire. They all wanted to support each other. And they said people were driving, in, and some of them were in limos, the whole family in a limo, to look at all the different uh, Spooky Awards. 
and, and Christmas will be the same thing. You know, it's funny, and a lot of these people that live here now, they moved from Toronto and they live in, here in Niagara Falls, said they just thought the spirit in the community was amazing. It got them to get to know their neighbors better. They said it was uplifting. They said the timing couldn't have been better. We're all in the doldrums. We're all depressed. We're all sad. And they said this gave us something to look forward to. And we heard kids say it. We heard the residents say it. Just it, it had this uplifting effect. The spooky words, and I, I know you'll do the same with the sparkle words. So appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Moldenhauer for you and your team and Chris with your creative marketing and, and all the support of the city. I think it's a winner. And uh, I'm going to... Definitely enter uh, Councillor Strange's house again this year. Hopefully he does more than one fake candle in the window this year. It looked pretty my spooky. Charlie, my what? Charlie Brown Christmas trees. <laughs> yeah, it was very spooky. It, yeah, Spooky awards are over. So uh, a motion by Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange that, that we support them, including $5,000 to make the event happen. Uh, and the support of all the staff and the website and everything else. Yeah, so with the be... spooky words, I, I think we went to council and received five thousand dollars, but um, I believe we only spent thirty-five hundred of it. So we're bringing fifteen hundred back, and we'll put towards next year. But yeah, we're asking for five thousand, but we might not spend that. But either Excellent. way, it'll help us execute and get the ball rolling on marketing. Under budget. Under games. budget. Under budget. Excellent. Okay. If there's no discussion on that. We'll call that vote. All those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that, Councillor Dabrowski. Any other new business? Mo motion for adjournment? <laughs> motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? And we're done. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you at the December meeting. Thank you.